Indoor Baseball all week at Minute Maid Park in downtown Houston. Two teams in our nightcap that are in need of a win to finish off this three-game stretch, the Houston Cougars and the Louisiana Ragin' Cajuns. Let's bring you inside the booth. Brett Dolan, Brian Bogusevic, delighted to have you with us. And, Brian, we have seen offensive-dominated games so far. It's not uncommon to see a little bump in the offensive production in the Sunday games of a series in college baseball. And both these teams, University of Houston and Louisiana, would love to see that offensive bump because their offense has lagged behind just a little bit this weekend. There's no doubt. They would like to see some offense for the Cougars. In fact, they had just one run in a loss to Vanderbilt, but it was Cameron Nickens who provided a home run. And Cameron Nickens, he's primarily in the lineup for his defense defense in center field, but yesterday showed some really quick hands turning on a pitch into the Crawford boxes, and he sprayed balls all over the field this weekend, so he's going to be somebody who can ignite the offense at the bottom half, turn it over to the guys at the top with some traffic on bases. Now for the Cajuns as well, they would like some offense. Duncan Pastor is one of those guys who's going to be in the mix this year, but also a guy who homered yesterday. Duncan Pastor with a really nice swing last night, took a slider down off of his shins and hit it into the Crawford boxes. That's not an easy pitch to elevate and this Louisiana offense has sputtered so far out of the gates this season. They're looking for him to be a catalyst in the middle of the order and eventually get Kyle DeBarge hitting like they know that he will. Well, you're right. That's a hard ball to hit out for a home run. This team hitting just 248 collectively. Maybe tonight is the night for the Raging Cajuns. Louisiana and Houston are nightcap. Game nine of the Astros Foundation College Classic. Our starting lineups, our first pitch straight ahead from Houston. The 6-4 and four Houston Cougars have this starting lineup tonight for Todd Whitting, Reynos, Reese, and Murray, the top three. Trey Jones going to have a big year, followed by Jimenez and Cameron Nickens, who he featured in the open. Then it's Cole, DeJesus, and French, the starting nine. So a little different lineup for the Cougs and Carson Fluno on the mound. And uh, Bogey, I'm excited to watch this young man pitch. Carson Fluno has been a great development story as, ever since he's gotten down to the Raging Cajun program. He was really raw coming out of a junior college in Wisconsin, but his velo has ticked up a little bit. He's been 91, 93, can mix the slider and the curveball, has a little bit of a split change. So he's been a very solid starter in that Sunday slot for the Raging Cajuns this year. Yeah, see what he can do against this Houston lineup today. And again, for the Cajuns, this has not been easy, and I think they knew it was going to be tough coming in, but you get a game against Vanderbilt and uh, had an early lead, fell 7-4, to competed last night against a good LSU team, but fell 5-4. 
the record doesn't really indicate how well they've played since they've been here. The competition has been tough, and they've been in every game, but you don't really want to hear about moral victories That's at right. this point in the season. You want to get some actual victories. There's no doubt. I mean, it's a fun weekend, but you want to leave here with at least a win. And that's what both of these teams will serve as their challenge this evening. And Jake Rain is about to step in. Our plate umpire here in the nightcap, Ron Teague. Michael Banks at first. Clint Fagan will umpire at second. Michael Durantis at third. We've been indoors all day. So not dealing with the breeze or anything to affect the baseball, but uh, the ball's been jumping over the last three days here at Minime. And the first pitch is strike one, and we're underway. Reynes, you see his numbers on the year, a fifth-year player. 16 homers, 47 knocked in a year ago. And Fluno's next pitch just a little bit off that outside corner. There's a lot of talk about what is going to change in this University of Houston program moving into the Big 12. One of the things that they talked about is the recruiting bump being in this Power Five conference. And Jake Reynes is really the first recruiting bump that they've seen. Somebody who was highly sought after in that transfer, transfer portal this offseason and chose the University of Houston over a lot of other options. No, I think you're right. Now that you're in the Big 12 and you know you're going to have an opportunity to play at that Power Five level, it's going to be enticing to a lot of kids. In addition to the weather and whatnot that you have in Houston. That's a wave and a miss. So a good start for Carson Fluno as he strikes out the game's first batter. There's a lot of different things you can talk to kids about as you're trying to bring them into your program. But really nothing can compare to week in, week out. We're going to play against great competition and make you the best version of yourself that we can. Yeah, I completely agree. And obviously the Big 12 will be in motion a little bit when Texas and Oklahoma leave but you're talking about a league that has teams that go from Florida to Ohio to Utah it really does cover quite a bit of the country Ace Reese steps in the box and takes strike one you also can go out and get talented young freshmen like a guy such as Ace Reese to jump into your program and that's the beauty of being in a location like Houston there is a lot of talent surrounding here within the within a couple hours drive that you can bring in what the Cougars would like to do is win a game though at Minute Maid Park this has not been a, a friendly place for them in recent years they've lost 11 straight here at the juice box last time they were in this event I believe was 2019 so jump back in off to a pretty good start this year but had a couple of losses so far and it was a tough one certainly to Texas State on Friday held Vandy to just three runs and then couldn't get the win and we saw what Vandy did earlier today they were down 11 to 3 and came back to win 14 to 11 pounding out 15 hits I think it was 11 unanswered runs <laughs> that they scored off of that Texas pitching staff but Vandy did it on pitching the first two games today obviously they did it with the bat not the complete effort that we saw from a team like LSU day in day out but definitely Vandy can do it on both sides next one to Reese cut on the missed so Fluno has struck out both Reynas and Reese to begin this game Matt Daggs told us earlier this week that Fluno's sinker is something that he's really been working on trying to get the ball down, but also the ability to elevate. When you start a hitter down at the bottom of the zone with a fastball that sinks, they really have their, their eyes set on that location. All of a sudden, the ball shows up way up. It's too enticing to lay off. Yeah, you can see this work in progress for Fluno, but it's one thing to start to improve upon your stuff and your abilities as he faces Justin Murray. It's another to do so while also having success. Good pitch flutters in for a strike to Murray on the breaking ball. Murray had hit in 23 straight games going back to last year before he was held in check yesterday. So one for seven this weekend. 23 stray games with a hit no Moss. See if he can start another streak here this evening. Of course hitting streaks don't count from one year to the next but nonetheless it is 23 straight games. Two 
2 1 is up and out. It's been about 91 92 with the velocity as Fluno. Justin Murray, a very under control hitter, very, very balanced, not a lot of movement in the batter's box. But here in a 3 1 count with an offense that sputtered a little bit, maybe he gets a little bit loose on one if he gets one in a spot. He's going to swing away and chops one that is going to be fair and down the line. I thought it was going to hit the base, and then Amity couldn't come up with it, so it trickles into the corner, and Murray's going to coast into second base. That was going to be a tough play for Amity coming in and to his backhand. It was kind of a do-or-die play, but it, what you really want to do is at the very least knock it down. He pulled up just a little bit early, and it sneaks under his glove. Murray ends up on second base. Yeah, he just not, did not look comfortable on that path to the baseball. It's going to be an E5, and here's Trey Jones. It was an E5. Now it's changed to a double. So there we go. See the numbers for Trey Jones, including a home run in this event. Three knocked in. Pitch between the belt and the ladder. Vandy really worked Trey Jones with a lot of soft stuff early in the count and yesterday tried to use his aggression against him. Fulano came in and dropped a breaking ball in for the first pitch and tried to crowd him with the fastball. Be surprised to see if he goes away from the soft stuff. Came right after him there and got him to foul one back. Jersey Village High School product, former Texas A&M Corpus Christi Islander, is Trey Jones. Luna already with a 1-2. The pitch is high, and Murray's going to take off for third base and make it without a throw. Murray had a nice walking lead there. Fluno really never turned back to stop him in that secondary lead, and he takes the base easily. But that's also a play where you can see the third baseman, Amade, playing off the base, kind of into the hole. You're that far from third base with two outs. You just tell the catcher no throw. So just 90 feet away. Comes racing down that line at third, but Jones will wave and miss. So Fluno does strike out three in the inning, works around that double. Strands a runner at third base, and the Cajuns coming to the back. Coach Deggs will run out a starting lineup that'll feature Broussard Jr., Halter, and Pastor, the top three. Amade in the cleanup spot, DeBarge the shortstop, Taylor at second, LaFleur back at first, Jose Torres behind the plate, Josh Alexander in center field, batting ninth, and they're going to face Duncan Howard, the Houston starter, through eight and two thirds innings of work so far this year. For the, first, for the third straight game, it's a transfer starting pitcher for the University of Houston Cougars. This 
Today it's Duncan Howard. One thing that you want out of a Sunday starter, your bullpen's already been used up a little bit. You want a strike thrower. He has yet to walk a batter this season. Well, love that. Presbyterian transfer. Broussard, the right fielder, steps in to begin things. Couple of hits this weekend at nine at bats. Ran so far and in the hands that he found it back to the screen for strike one. Six three right hander from North Carolina. Another one fouled away down the right field side into the upper tank. This Louisiana team though they would like to find a little more offense 248 collectively 12 home runs in the course of what has been 10 games to this point. It's always been a program that is concentrated on defense and pitching and last year they stole a ton of bases set a fielding percentage record but just haven't gotten off to a really truly good start defensively and still trying to find a little more offense. Maybe that's the beginning. They sit into left between DeJesus and Reynas. And Broussard begins the bottom of the first with a single. Well, that'll help get the offense going. It's always nice to get the leadoff hitter on to start an inning. And Coach Matt Daggs has never been one to sit around and wait for things to happen. He wants to force the issue a little bit. And you see a couple of lineup changes today. A lot of left-handed hitters in the lineup trying to take away that breaking ball from a right-handed pitcher. So five lefties in the lineup today for the Raging Cajuns. He Cavers. certainly went lefty righty heavy earlier in this event as well. So kind of playing some of the percentages. And this is Jackson Halter. And for that measure has just won it back this year. So getting his opportunity. Texarkana Texas native. There's Jackson Halter. Brian, I was just beginning to ask you if maybe we'd see the Cajuns running a little bit early when you're not down early in a contest if you might pull the trigger and send guys and put them in motion right out of the gates. If you get down by a couple of runs early it really limits your options as to what you can do from a small ball standpoint and when that is your game you don't want to be waiting around and all of a sudden be behind and ha be handcuffed a little bit so not surprising to see the Cajuns forcing the issue early. One and two to Halter. Howard really closes off that stance just a bit. A flip to first and Broussard who has not attempted to steal yet back in diving. No batting gloves for Jackson Halter. Choking up a bit from the bottom of that bat. Broussard will run. Wave it a miss. That throw is headed towards center. What a nice leaping stop by Reynas to keep that from continuing on. And that's a stolen base for Broussard and a strikeout for Duncan Howard. French got his money's worth on this throw. Pretty good pitch to throw on. It's an elevated fastball, so French was up out of his stance. But Broussard just got too good of a jump. You see, even with the jump and the catch by Reynas, Broussard still in there in time. Looked like Reynas came down on his leg or his calf. This is Duncan Pastor, Tampa native. Hit one home run this year and it came in this event. A Nova Southeastern product, four year letter winner, hit 351 in his career. And for Astros fans, they probably might remember that school. It produced J.D. Martinez. Among others. <laughs> others. <laughs> <laughs> Probably not to the level of a J.D. Martinez, but I'm sure he's not the only one. There's a ground ball to second to Harold Cole. Makes the play and throws out Pastor. And now there's two outs as Broussard goes to third base. It can't be underestimated guys who go to a smaller school like that maybe who wouldn't have gotten a chance to play from day one at a big school but they go down there they get a ton of at bats early and whether whether they transfer into another school or they go into pro ball have just a ton of experience behind them at bats. There's no substitute right. for getting live at bats. Lee Amade, the cleanup hitter takes strike one. 
It allows the guy to maybe bloom a little bit late. Just get stronger, better, bigger. Our plate umpire Ron Teague is telling Duncan Howard to make eye contact or make sure that Amade is in the box before he's ready to go. Based on the number of pitching changes we've seen this weekend, I would not discourage pace. I would say <laughs> I'm always for pace. <laughs> Amade is thinking about pushing one to third with De Jesus way off the line and playing a little bit deep. It's the one element of these college teams really shifting. You don't have quite the big league athletes that can cover a lot of ground if a, a bun is placed in that perfect spot. And that one just missed the corner. The Cougars were on their way to the dugout. The, the small ball game, it's kind of a two way street. Number one, you're trying to take advantage of what the defense is giving you but also you're trying to put pressure on the defense like you said these are still college kids you, they haven't had the experience that a professional third baseman would have so you put the ball in play you make them make a play and if you make a perfect bunt you got a hit or you have a chance for them to make a mistake we've seen a couple of balls thrown away on bunts we've seen a, a ball dropped at first base by the second baseman who's getting over there to cover Little tapper that's going to stay fair. Thought that might hit the base, but Murray's got a play, takes it back unassisted. Both teams stranded a runner at third base in a scoreless first. Off we go to the second in game nine of the College Classic. Cougars and Cajuns here in the Sunday nightcap by the Astros Foundation College Classic. I would say both of these fan bases probably heavily Astros favorite as well. So they've been in this ballpark a time or two but to see their favorite college baseball program play here pretty good experience something hard to pass up. We've seen huge crowds really over the course of these three days anxious to hear what the uh, final number may be is Kenneth Jimenez will bat to begin the bottom of the second against Carson Fluno. Three runs batted in six hits for Jimenez limited A.B.'s but maybe worth getting a few more opportunities. Tucson Arizona native Nogales High School which is down near the border there's a Nogales Mexico and Arizona South Mountain Community College product also at Yavapai so a couple of different stops first one out of the state of Arizona. Fluno just ran that one too far in. Plunks him in it. Yeah, that's not what Fluno is looking for. He's not looking for side to side run. He's looking for sink. He wants to get on top of that two seamer and 
kind of drive it down underneath the hands of a right-handed hitter. That one just gets too much side-to-side -side movement, ends up right in Jimenez's elbow. So leadoff base runner for the Cougs, Cameron Nickens. Next man in. Couple of hits, including a home run in this event. Junior from Magnolia, Texas. 54 games a season ago, hit five home runs. Got plenty of opportunities as well as a freshman in 2022. When was your biggest jump? Freshman year, sophomore year, sophomore to junior? Probably freshman to sophomore year. I think, you know, coming in from high school to a freshman, you're just kind of swimming and trying to take it all in. Once you have a year under your belt, you go through a full summer and then come in for the fall and, and really take advantage of that sophomore year fall when you know what the program is going to be, know where your opportunities to get better are. I thought that was the easiest time to really improve as a player. That makes sense. And, you know, you start to get used to the college game in general, but then get a little bigger and stronger and facing a lot more quality pitching. And it also depends, too, what your background is as a player. I was a guy who was coming out of the North. We were playing 35 game seasons in high school and not a ton of summer ball. So I was behind in terms of at bats and just experience in general. So getting a full season of 56 game season of at bats. Hard one hopper picked by Taylor flips to second for one a spin and a fire to first double play for now. The Cougars may challenge this. Brian, what a nifty turn from Taylor and DeBarge. Challenge or not, that's a heck of a play. That's an in-between hop for Taylor that he plays perfectly, and then with the spin to second base to try to make the turn. And that looks like a base hit in first and third or first and second and worse, and then you get the pick by Taylor. DeBarge with a nice pirouette, and I didn't think he was going to have a chance to get Nickens, but called out on the field, so we'll review this one. I think he's going to be safe. Probably, but you really got to see a look at Kyle DeBarge's the angle, arm yeah. right there because he came out of that spin and just fired a bullet. But Cam Nickens, that's a true center fielder right there, and he can really get down the line. No, I hadn't thought about that as you were discussing your amateur career but just not the benefit of many games in Chicago and this is a little better angle that we'll see here and it looks like that base foot is on the base and the ball is not yet in the glove so the Cougars may win this one. So not a double play style points for the Cajuns but uh, Nickens will be aboard with one out. No double play, but you still are just one pitch away from getting out of this inning, as opposed to being in a first and third situation with nobody out. You've got a ground ball pitcher on the mound who's a ground ball away from being out of it. You know, Coach Dex really talked about his middle infielders, Taylor and DeBarge, and how highly he thought of those two. And this is Harold Cole, former San Jack star in Arkansas Razorback turned Cougar. We get a little glimpse of that, though, as well from Taylor and DeBarge. Couple of home runs for Harold. Saw him play last year sparingly in the SEC. And I thought he was going to win that battle in Arkansas at shortstop. And he probably was ahead offensively than his counterpart. Off and rolling is Nickens, and the throw down is not in time. Torres let that one go, but Nickens gets the base, his fourth of the year. Good pitch to run on right there. It's a breaking ball that ends up down in the zone. So even though Nickens didn't get that great of a jump, just a tough pitch to throw on. Finish my thought on Cole, though. He may have been behind John Bolton defensively, even though he was a better offensive shortstop. So Arkansas went with the defense. And uh, probably not as much playing time as Cole wanted. So the U of H recruited him out of San Jack, and I think it was probably an easy transition for him then to come to Houston for more playing time. 
you well, remember the teams that recruit you. And if you end up back into the transfer portal, those are going to be the first teams you go to because they're the ones that you're familiar with and you know that they like you to begin with. 3-0 pitch right down the pipe for a strike. It's an interesting time in college baseball with the free transfer rules and of course there's NIL money to be sought after but it's a ne the recruiting process is never ending now it, just because you get a guy on campus or just because you're in a place for a year doesn't mean that's where you're stuck. No one's going to get by Torres and go to the backstop he's going to play the care but Nickens will advance to third base on the wild pitch. And in fact that's going to be ball four as well to Cole so now there's runners on the corners. And to your point when we talked with David Pierce from the Texas Longhorns we kind of touched on the transfer portal with him and he said listen I feel like I did a pretty good job recruiting my guys to come back. Let's not lose track of that. It isn't always about bringing in other players. It's about keeping my guys. Keeping a, that nucleus. There's a full roster that you have to recruit along with going out there and finding guys in the portal along with going out there and finding high school kids to bring in as freshmen. So. I don't envy the job that these coaches have either. to do right now. Feels like there's so much on their plate. This is Kobe De Jesus, and no throw down as Cole will take the base. So now the Cougars have runners at second and third. It's hard enough to go out and uh, you know get some guys to commit early, and then you think or you realize you're going to lose them to the draft, and then you're trying to figure out who's going to make it to school. As we see, Cole break towards second without a throw. Then there's the portal. You're a mid-major team. You worry about losing somebody to a power five squad. Corners are creeping in on the pitch to De Jesus, and it is not going to be a swing on the appeal. Michael Banks said De Jesus did not offer. Just three at bats on the year, but a couple of base hits for De Jesus, so a big opportunity for him. It's going to take one just off that outside edge. That didn't miss by a lot. This is not a situation where you want to get over aggressive just because you're ahead in the count. The runners are in scoring position. A ground ball in the middle of the field will score one. Your two RBIs are out in the middle of the field, so no reason to try to pull anything here. Use the big part of the field. Big wave and a miss. Was the count off? Was it really 3 0 and he took that big hack? If you're going to swing 3 0, you might as well swing <laughs> well, you big. You might as well. That's an eight hole hitter with three at bats all year. That took me a little bit by surprise, I will admit. Blue nose next pitch. Another big hack and a foul ball back to the screen. The hit batter for Fluno kind of kickstarted this inning heading in the wrong direction. And then he walked Cole as well. Was behind De Jesus. Now he's seen the count run full. Now all the infielders creep in all the way around. And a payoff pitch, wave it a miss. That breaking ball had De Jesus locked up. And that's an important strikeout. It's a heck of a job by Fluno right there, coming all the way back from 3 0. And trusting his stuff enough to get back to that three two count and still throw a breaking ball to get swing and miss for strike three. This is Jonathan French the catcher. And a couple of home runs for his four hits this year infield back of course with two outs and the pitch to French is in there for strike one and even with the base open with runners on second and third you've still got the nine hole hitter up so if you're Carson Fluno you don't want to give in give French something to hit but at the same time you want to end this inning here you don't want to flip it back over to the top There's of the no order. doubt about that. Next pitch he's been nibbling on those corners and a couple of times when he's missed it hasn't been by a wide margin. No he he's throwing the ball exactly where he wants it even his balls for most of the time that he's missing are just a couple of inches off and when, when you're just a few inches off the plate with your misses that sets you up for other things you get Jonathan French leaning out over the plate a little bit on that slider now you can bust him in hard hit in the air to right field Broussard turning and running looking up and it is gone a three run shot and the Cougars needed that. 
an injection of a little bit of life in that dugout and three score on one big swing. That's a heck of a swing by Jonathan French. It's a fastball that's supposed to come all the way in under his hands, but it doesn't get in quite far enough. He's able to pull his hands in and get inside of it. And then that's a lot of strength to be able to inside out a ball about halfway up the bleachers there in right field. Well, the ball's flying today. I knew he hit it well, and I thought he got it out, but that easily cleared the fence. You don't see many right-handed hitters go that far up into the bleachers there in right field. So three runs on one hit this inning, and here's Reynos back at the top of the lineup, struck out to begin the game. After one run yesterday and that loss to Vandy, that must feel good when your nine hole hitter pops a three run homer against his good pitcher, Carson Fluno, who gets another strikeout. That's his four through two innings, but uh, he'll be scratching his head a while on that inning. A three run homer from French, and the Cougs are off and rolling. What do we have there, Bogey? Some nachos? It's a ballpark staple, the nachos. You'd have to hose me down if I was reaching into that thing for about <laughs> half an inning. Kyle DeBarge is going to lead off the bottom of the second. The Cajuns have some work to do, down 3 0. DeBarge, Taylor, and LaFleur against Duncan Howard. Ground ball rolled up the middle. Reynos can't get there, and that's a base hit for DeBarge, his second of the weekend. I like the aggressiveness there by Kyle DeBarge. Yes, you just gave up a three spot in the top of the inning, but no real reason to go away from your plan. He's trying to get himself jump started. He's trying to get this offense jump started. If you see a good pitch to hit, go ahead and put it in play. That's a guy that Coach Degg said he's going to play in the big leagues. Also said one of my favorite all-time players. And Kind of equated him in a sense to Bregman and, and not maybe necessarily in tools as much as the fact he just said he's simply a winner. Yeah I think the, the comparison to Alex Bregman is almost as much off the field as it is Agreed. on a, a guy who does everything right a guy who holds teammates accountable a guy who's out there interested in nothing other than helping his team win games. Singular focus to barge will run French's throw bounces and it's going to skip in the center. So DeBarge is going to take off and continue to third base. Now the ball gets behind Nickens, and DeBarge can coast to the plate and score. A stolen base and maybe two errors in that sequence. And that's how the Cajuns get a run. You'll take it any way you can get it. When you're having trouble scoring runs, whatever you got to do, and Kyle DeBarge is out there not waiting around. He, he swings at the first pitch. He runs on the first pitch, and... When you're aggressive, good things can happen. And we talked about putting pressure on the defense. Kyle DeBarge did that, and it paid off. 
Indeed two errors on the play. And John Taylor. Takes one down in the dirt. You spend a lot of time in the outfield. That's one of those where you just uh, you're almost in disbelief that ball gets by in center. Well and if you notice the way Cam Nickens went after that ball he was going after it almost as if it was a do or die like he was going to have to come up throwing to home his play was never going to be at home he just had to pick it up and throw it Knock back it in down. As, as, <laughs> soon, as soon as he gets to that ball if he just breaks down and picks it up Kyle DeBarge is going to shut it down and be standing on third base but That's coming up like point, that, that that looks like a guy who's thinking about making a throw when really all he has to do is just catch it and pick it up. Saw pop up by Taylor, and this will be tracked down by French. He makes the catch. Now you saw that in real time, and our replay was fantastic. That's not a do or die situation. You just got to, you know, sometimes that ball might snake a little bit in the outfield as well. And and think about the difference between if you get a base hit to you in center field, and the guy's just got an easy single. You're going to have two feet in front of you, bend over, pick it up, toss it in. If you have a runner on second base and you get a base hit, you're charging hard. You're fielding it off of one foot so that you can come up and throw. And that's how Cam Nickens went after that ball. But there was there was not a throw to be made. And it cost him a run because that pop up would have given Howard an opportunity maybe to strike out the floor and navigate through it. Twelve hits for LaFleur, including a couple of home runs. And that one's going to be fouled to the left and back in the seats and out of play. It's tough to learn that way with a play like that, but that'll be something that Cam Nickens will think about moving forward. It's one of those things you would never think about that situation until you are in it. That's the, the beauty and the difficulty of the game of baseball is that a lot of times you just have to be in a situation and experience something to be expecting it the next yeah. time. There's so many different scenarios and things that can happen out there. You can't account for all of them just talking about the game. You have to fail sometimes in order to learn. The one thing I would say, this is such a tough outfield to play. If you're in left field, you're dealing with the funny bounces off the out-of-town scoreboard. You got the well and the, the pillars. You no longer have the hill in center, but it's a deep right center. There's a lot of ground to cover in this ballpark and some funny quirks and angles. You don't need to complicate and make things more difficult for yourself and, on top of and that. And it's not something that you often see in college baseball. Most college parks have pretty standard dimensions in the outfield. Not a whole lot of intricacies like you see here. Minute Maid, one of the more intricate ballparks in all of baseball. I would say the one thing about Minute Maid, when you're talking about left field and that short porch, even at times in right, it's really hard at times to score from second base. You think about some of the bigger outfields, you get a hard one hopper to right or to left, it might be an opportunity to throw a guy out of the plate, but you can hit a ball to the pillars in left center or towards the edge of the bullpen in right center, it's going to be easy to score from first and maybe three bases. It's something that we used to talk about here playing the advantage that we had knowing the ballpark and knowing that if you're a base runner on second base here at Minute Maid Park you have to be ultra aggressive in your secondary lead because that line drive single between the shortstop and the third baseman that you would score easily on in another park with an outfielder playing at standard depth he's going to be Good picking point. it up here before you get to third base so you've got to get an extra jump you've got to get an extra step before the ball is even hit. That's a high pop up. Murray will handle it and retire LaFleur for the second out. I think that's well said because you're not just talking about the difficulty of scoring but then the importance of that secondary lead and, and reading the ball off the bat so there's not that hesitation because at least back in the old National League days there were a lot of 4 3 3 2 games where one run could tip the scale now a little more offensive in the game right now but but back then you couldn't afford to leave a runner a third that should have scored. Absolutely. And, and if it's something that's within your control, something like getting a bigger lead, taking a more aggressive secondary lead, it's something that you should do every time as long as you know that that's the game you're going to have to play in a given ballpark. Jose Torres, the catcher. Hit a homer against LSU. There's Coach Deggs. We'll talk to him a little bit later on. That ball socked towards left. Did a drop in front of Reese. So Torres has two out single. Well, that's going to make an unearned run earned. <laughs> also brings up Josh Alexander.
Alexander hitting 333 in the nine hole. We were just talking about the damage that has been done in that nine spot this weekend for really all nine games. The nine hitters are not second leadoff type guys in the lineups that we've seen this week. They've been going out and they're swinging big bats. Sprayed foul way down the line and left into the second level of seats. It's so difficult as a pitcher when the bottom third of the lineup is dangerous. When, when you navigate the middle of the order but then can't really come up from air and have and have an at bat or two off. It just builds and builds and builds and, and really exhausts pitchers. Oh and to the count to Alexander. And pitch the well, cutter slider there missed off the corner to Alexander. Long pause before the one two pitch and that is a wave of the miss so they get getting ends. Cajuns get a run back at a couple of hits off and rolling through two. It's a two run Houston advantage. It's 3-1 Cougars, and their head coach, Todd Whitting, joins us. Hey Todd, guys. Brett Dolan, Brian Bogusevic, and yeah. Captain Obvious here, but i got to believe that three-run homer from French felt pretty good down in that dugout. Yeah, it did. We've been waiting for one of those for a couple games, so we just got to, you know, we got to try to stack some more. He's tough. I mean, he keeps you off balance, two pitches for a strike, and, you know, the differential and the velocity on both pitches is kind of tough on us, but we'll grind him out. Coach, we've seen quite a few transfer arms on the mound for you guys yeah. uh, so far this weekend. Uh, I just want to know a little bit about the balance in recruiting, being able to fill through the transfer portal for immediate needs, but also still the desire to develop players yeah. long term. Yeah, that's something we talk about as a staff a lot. We do have probably five of the best freshman arms that I've ever had. So we have those guys waiting to wings. You saw one yesterday in Solis who's going to be outstanding. But, you know, you uh, you build your you build your pitching staff with high school kids and you plug holes with the uh, Juco and the transfers. And I think we've done a pretty good job of it. Having said that, Todd, as I look at the top of your lineup now with Reese and Murray and Jones, to have Reynos, Reese, Murray, Jones, it really feels like it gives you a great beginning to building those nine. No, it does. You know, we've we got an older bunch, veteran bunch, and, and they played a lot of Division One baseball. So it, they're fun to watch. All right, Todd, final thought. First year in the Big 12. How much are your kids looking forward to that, and, and how much work do you have to kind of build before you get into that conference slate here coming up real soon? Well, you know, they're excited, obviously, for me. You know, playing the Southwest Conference and was around when it broke up, it's very exciting for me and our fans. But, you know, for them, you, yeah, you can't make too big a deal out of it. You still got to go on the windy games, and we've come out of a really good baseball league in the American. No doubt. Todd, hey, thanks for the time tonight. All right, guys, thanks. Thank you. This team last year won 36 games. Brian, they were 17-6 and six in the American, and, and – you just can't get that at large berth. I know that's frustrating. If you win that many games in the Big 12, you will be in a regional. And that's one of the advantages of going to the larger conferences is the RPI numbers and the benefit of the, the doubt that you're going to get when you're facing quality competition week in, week out. Everyone's just going to assume that you are a better club because of that. I think that's where the excitement comes. As Justin Murray bats, doubled in the first and was stranded to third. And 
You know, there was some thought with that Cougar basketball program. They were so good last year, but how would they fare when they jumped up to the Big 12? Well, they, they've answered that. Been pretty good, Not hasn't a problem. It? They will be a number one seed in the uh, in the tournament. And, you know, there is a difference in, in talent maybe coming from an American overall to the Big 12, but it doesn't mean in this talent-rich area you can't catch up quickly if there is any issue. And then, as we talked about, you get in the portal when you have a few needs and you try and plug those gaps immediately. And I think that's the most important thing for the University of Houston moving into the Big 12 is that they are ready made for that level of competition. They, they have a ton of recruits locally. They, they have kids who have played a lot of baseball um, before they get here. So and, and then you have the draw of being able to recruit nationally because you can bring kids from the north down and say, hey, we're down here and we're outside every day in the warm That's weather. Right. And you're just going to get more experience than you would at a, at a school up north. And Murray's going to wave and miss. That is now three straight strikeouts for the last five hitters that Fluno has faced. He struck out. The only one he didn't hit a three-run homer against him. Fluno's starting to get a real good feel for that curveball. It was more sinker, slider, harder breaking ball early, but he's really started to drop that curveball in, working north and south on these Cougar hitters. Two gone for Trey Jones. He just smokes one to short. Pick by DeBarge. What a glove. Strong throw. Nice play, Brian, to win the inning. Well done. 3 1 our score. So we get to the bottom of the third. The 2024 season tickets are on sale now. You can catch every home run, every double play, and every game of the 2024 season by becoming an Astros season ticket holder and get access to every postseason game. Visit Astros.com slash season tickets to learn more. And Brian, the key line there is access to every postseason game. You know you're going to be here. In if, the... <laughs> if you want those postseason tickets, you'll go ahead and buy yourself a season ticket package. But it's nice when you have an organization that can operate under the assumption that right. there's going to be postseason baseball. <laughs> Broussard skies one out to right. That's a long run for Jones nearing the railing and he just about went right into the uh, short fence. You ready though to be back. <laughs> she, she gave the ball back. <laughs> she got it back after all that. You know, that little corner down there has always been difficult to navigate. You're running to the line. You've got the wall, you've got the cutout, but now there's a net that you have to deal That's with right. also. I think it's scared her. I think she's okay. You get the ball back and then Jones said, no, you, you can have it. Here you go. There's a bunt that's popped up. We've got a new catcher, I believe. That play is made. Broussard tried to go sneak attack with the bunt, but just couldn't get it down on the ground.
That is French. There's been a couple of changes. Reynas is out at short. There's a liner from Halter into center for a base hit. It's beginning to say, though, you're back on the pre and post game shows this year for quite a few on the new network. We're about to start ramping up here pretty soon. So. It's about go time. Spring training games, we're kind of past the point of spring training where the guys are playing sporadically. It's it's starting to be a lot more regular, so it's ramping up here quick. This is Duncan Pastor. Pick it first and Halter back in diving. Guy gets his first hit of the year. You have to try and pick him off, don't you? He's over there. He's kind of floating it's high. Not comfortable out there. <laughs> he doesn't know where he, he's at. You know, this is a spot runner on base. You've got the middle of the order coming up where Cajuns really would like to get at least one here in this inning. There's a chopper towards short. DeJesus, the new shortstop, throws to Cole on the first, not in time. Big bounce wasn't a tailor-made double play grounder, but now two outs in the inning. Yeah, that big that big bounce forced DeJesus to play it off of his back foot, and that, that extra bounce just allowed for too much time for Pastor to beat it out. And again, that is DeJesus, who started at third. He moved to short. Lycee is now at third base. Rain is out of the game, so I'm not sure if something happened or not. We had a couple of strikeouts and it's been replaced. This is Amade batting for the second time. Pastor back in diving at first. We get a couple of 0 and 2 teams this weekend trying to find a way to get a win. Get out of here with a W and there's your new third baseman. Thomas Lysing from Harlingen, Texas. That pitch up and out to Amade. Not your prototypical cleanup hitter here with 200 average and one run batted in, but this is a Cajun team just trying to kind of figure things out offensively as we go forward. And right now, I don't think it's a matter of trying to find power in that four hole. I think really what Matt Deggs is looking for is just a bunch of guys who can string together quality at bats. Well, it makes sense as they're trying to put some runs on the board. Amade will take, and that's a little bit up and out. He had a father that played baseball at Nichols. Louisiana native. You know something about playing college baseball in the state of Louisiana. I've been to all those places. I bet you have. It's a two lane star. I pitch in there for a strike. You don't find fans like Louisiana college baseball fans anywhere else in the country. How do you describe it to somebody back in Chicago when you were off to Tulane? They wouldn't understand <laughs> even if you could describe it to them. There might be a little similarity with Wrigley. You know, it's kind of a party, but uh, nonetheless, that one's fouled away. There is a passion in the state of Louisiana. You see one in Mississippi. There, there's some really great college baseball fans. It's it's pretty unique to see a, a fan base whose college baseball team is their number one baseball team. You know, in Louisiana, they don't have a professional team. They don't have anybody who they're really aligned with. So they cheer for their college baseball team. Pastor is going to run. Big chopper to Cole. Back in the outfield grass. He'll make the play and throw out. Amade to end the third inning. So Cajuns get a hit. Strand a runner. Remains a 3-1 Houston lead.
Cougars three, Cajuns one. As we go to the fourth, Matt Deggs joins us as well. And coach, it feels like Carson Fluno's pitching really well. It probably magnifies the frustration of just one pitch that cost him three runs. Yeah, well, we had a couple of freebies mixed in there that inning, and and uh, that usually comes back to get you. Just missed on the fastball, supposed to be in. It looked like it was center cut on the replay. Hey, Coach, in, in trying to get this offense jump started, what are your thoughts on the lineup construction? A little bit different today, a lot of lefties in there. Yeah, just still working to figure out our personnel right now and, and uh, you know, see where everybody – I got 20 hitters, so you got to see where everybody fits in the puzzle. They're all talented. It's just a matter of where they fit, where they go. Ben, you told us a couple of days ago about the defense around your team. It's certainly your middle infielders, DeBarge and Taylor. And it's one thing for you to tell us that. It's another to see it. We've, we've seen them both make a couple of really nice picks today, showing off their skill set. Yeah, they're pretty good in the middle and, and been spoiled the last couple of years. And uh, Debo's as good as it gets out there at short. Coach, coming out there in the bottom of the second inning, we saw Kyle DeBarge really aggressive, swinging early, running the bases. Is that is that something that you had to tell the offense to stay aggressive, or do those guys just know that's how they're supposed to play? No, that's the way we play. And, uh, you know, if the game presents that opportunity, we're going to be aggressive. Hey, Matt, thanks so much for stopping by today. Okay, I appreciate it. Been great to us all week as DeBarge rolls out to begin the bottom of the fourth inning. This can be a long week, too. I mean, there's some excitement to get here. The workout on Thursday. You don't take BP on the field, so there's a lot of sitting around waiting to see when you're going to play, especially when you have the night game. And then you want to do well, and you lose a one run game last night to LSU. And, you know, there's a little bit of kind of compounding angst. Anytime the game doesn't turn out the way you want, and anytime you, you don't get the results that you want, you want to fall back on your routine. What can I do that I know gets me ready for the game? But when you're in a scenario like this where you're not taking batting practice every day when you don't necessarily know what time the game is going to start when you're sitting out in the stands waiting. It throws all of that off. So the ability to turn the page from day to day becomes even more difficult. And this is Nickens. Jimenez had the ground out to begin the inning, and Nickens reached on a fielder's choice on what we thought was a double play. It was overruled, and then he would later score on that home run from French. You know, everybody thinks that Baseball players are, are superstitious and they're just kind of weirdos for some of the habits that they have. But really what it is, it's, it's a comfort thing. We try to do things the same all the time so that we feel ready to go out there and compete. It's so difficult to go out there on a day-to-day -day basis and hit a baseball or make pitches. You have to trick yourself mentally into thinking you are ready and, and there's nothing else you could have done to get ready. And when that's thrown off, it's tough. Yeah, you prepare out of fear or the fear of failure at times. Nickens lifting the ball in the air, left center field. He didn't quite get enough, but it's still out there to the track where Halter will run it down. Pretty good ride that Nickens gave that baseball, but it's out number two. There are a lot of spots in this ballpark where it is an ad <laughs> where it's advantageous for a hitter to hit the ball. That is not one of them. It gets really deep quickly out there in that left center field gap. How much communication goes on between a center fielder and left fielder when you're getting back towards those pillars and everything else that's going on? A ton. I, there's there's the traditional communication, the, the I got it, I got it, I got it, that kind of stuff. But at the same time, when you have a left fielder who's running back into the well like that in unfamiliar unfamiliar territory, he doesn't want to take his eyes off of the ball, especially not that late. When he goes and looks back up, he's not going to be able to find that ball. So he's got to trust his center fielder to be watching him, telling him, okay, the track is coming up. You got room, you got room, or wall, wall, wall. That's the communication that they're doing right before that ball is caught. Cole with the liner just over the leap of DeBarge into left field. So he's walked in now single for the Cougars. Communication in the outfield is one of the most underrated aspects of defensive play out in the outfield. It's pre-pitch talking. You know, I'm, I'm taking a couple steps over, so you're going to have to cover the gap. Or I'm playing in, you're going to have to come behind me if there's a, a line drive hit to my right. Uh, telling your offside outfielders where the wall is or backing up plays. So there's a lot that goes on to it. It's not just running around and, and running it down. I'm wondering for the visiting team whether they get some help from their guys in the bullpen as well when you're trying to track the ball out there towards those pillars. You would hope so. Everybody kind of knows where the spots are, where it's going to be difficult. So if they can tell you, hey, the warning track is coming up or you, you got to reach for the wall or something, anything helps. Well, this is to Jesus. Remember, he started 
At third, he's moved to short. Two out single by Cause continued this inning. And that went up and in. So a little different lineup as well for the Cougars. DeJesus had one at bat. All season. Little chopper rolled over towards the dugout. Six seniors on this Cougar team that will primarily be in that lineup on a regular basis. 22 newcomers this year, 14 transfers. Off to a 6-4 and four start with the losses in the first two games of the college classic. Could have jumped into conference play against Baylor. Coming up next weekend. After a midweek game Tuesday against Sam Houston. Then a roadie to BYU in mid-March. I bet that won't be warm. There's a throw that's going to skip in the center. Boy, the throws to second base have been an adventure here in this game. And Cole will get the stolen base and no further advancement. That's his second base. There have been a lot of really big jumps by base runners. And when the catcher sees a base runner get that big of a jump, he's going to rush his throw. A lot of these throws are missing high. A lot of them are missing arm side. Those are catchers who are just trying to get rid of it as fast as they can, and they don't have their feet underneath them. Two and one the count. Cougars trying to add to this 3-1 lead. Lunos next pitch. Is that a swing? I think it's close. In fact, it is. No appeal needed. Played on by Ron Teague said that is a swinging strike, and the count's two and two. This is two at-bats a row for, for Kobe DeJesus where he looks a little bit jumpy. He, he's not letting the ball get to him. They're throwing him a lot of off-speed pitches, which is fine as long as you let that travel. You let the ball get into the strike zone. He's really got to be thinking right field here. And that's a wave and a miss. He got the breaking ball, came up empty, and the Cougars will strand a runner in scoring position. Three and a half complete. 3-1 Cougars over the Cajuns. Cougars up 3-1 as the Cajuns bat here at the bottom of the fourth. Brett Dolan, Brian Bogusevic for game nine of this Astros Foundation College Classic. I don't think it's that cold. Need a sweatshirt. We've been indoors all day. A little bit of rain maybe early this morning. Cougars trying to get a win, as are the Cajuns. DeBarge has scored the lone Louisiana run. He singled in the second, swiped a base, and then he just kept going. There was a throwing error in the center and an error by Nickens in center. And that ball driven to left field, hit well towards the edge of the Crawford boxes. It's going to sneak in, and it's gone. Kyle DeBarge with a homer. And he makes this a 3-2 game. Kyle DeBarge has made it quite apparent he's not going to wait around for anything. He swung at the first pitch, his last two at-bats. This time he gets a fastball that he just hits an absolute 
missile into the Crawford boxes. And there's a lot of ways to get yourself jump started at the plate. One of those is to affect the game in other ways. And Kyle DeBarge did it on the bases. We've seen him do it defensively. And now all of a sudden, don't let that bat get hot. I thought he might just sneak it to the right of that yellow line, but he hit it in the right spot. He was flirting with that, that is it a homer or is it a double <laughs> area out there? John Taylor takes what in. Fourth home run for DeBarge. He has four of his team's 13. So he's tightened up this game. Taylor hit a pop up to the catcher French. His only time in. He smokes one to center field and it'll drop in front of Nickens. Took one hard bounce and he plays it back in. So here come the Cajuns and their bats in the bottom of the fourth inning. Well, Matt Deggs just told us that his team is always going to be aggressive. They're always going to play aggressively, and they've really started to take it to the pitcher here in, in these last couple of innings. They're not waiting around. When you have a strike thrower on the mound, there's no reason to take pitches just to take them because all you're going to do is be 0-1, 0-2. So you might as well get up there and swing and go ahead and get your A swing off on something early. How much of that is discussed before the game if you have a strike thrower as far as the need to be aggressive and versus working the count? You always know what your approach is going to be going into the game. Things can vary a little bit, definitely here at the college level. You want to make sure that a pitcher is going to be able to find the zone. You don't want to be out there and, sw and, and swinging early if a guy's just going to start walking people. But it became apparent pretty early that Duncan Howard was going to be filling it up and throwing strikes. So once that happens and you know a guy's going to be throwing strikes early in the count, Go ahead and swing. There, there's, it doesn't matter if you hit the fifth pitch of the at-bat or the first pitch of the at-bat. I want you putting a good swing on a good pitch to hit. And it brings up the dangerous Trey LaFleur. It's a Florida native. He drives one to right field. This ball has a little bit of top spin to it, and Jones will make the catch. Coach Deggs dropped a David Justice on us the other day when it comes from a body type for LaFleur, and I've been anxious to watch him play this weekend. And Hit that ball pretty hard, but he's out. Tall, long levers and kind of a, a swing with a lot of leverage in it. That time he just got on top of that ball just a little bit too much, but that's that's pretty smooth from the left side. Jose Torres, the Florida native and the catcher, has a single, one of the six hits for the Cajuns. The Cajuns have six hits now to three for the Cougars, but one of those three hits provided three runs on the homer from French for U of H. Howard's pitch up and out. Pretty good job by French just to catch it, and that was close at first. That's when you probably want to go back with the dive right there. Well, if you get tagged out going in standing on a high throw down to first, that would not go over well. He was safe, but it was close. Another throw to first has to scramble back in. Taylor's not attempted to steal yet, but we've seen these teams being aggressive on the bases tonight. Long pause from Howard before the pitch. Runner goes. That's a wave and a miss. Torres may have been out there to protect his base runner. I don't know, but he really chased one far off that outside corner and Taylor gets the base. That looked like the swing of a guy who knew he had to swing at that pitch. I think the hit and run was on there. We saw Taylor get a decent jump, but not a huge one. And it, as Taylor's looking He's back peaking. in there to see if he got protected. If you're Jose Torres, it's all you can do. It's not a pitch <laughs> that you can really do anything with. Fouled back to the right and out of play. There's that fine line between I have to swing to protect him but it might just be bad enough of a pitch that he's going to be safe anyways. I was thinking the same thing. You might be able to get away with not chasing that one if it's so far outside. Come backer. Throw to second base, and that wasn't exactly perfectly executed, but it's still going to result in it out. As De Jesus came scrambling in, he kind of landed on top of Taylor, and they'll get the lead runner. I might have just taken the out at first, but nonetheless, there's two gone. It's a nice play by Duncan Howard on a hard comebacker to knock that ball down and stop it. And 
Taylor just gets hung out there. You, you've got to make the decision quickly. He knows he's hung up. He's either got to put his head down and go to third, put his head down, go back to second. He chose second, just not quite enough. Josh Alexander struck out his only time in. So now two on in the inning. Big cut, no contact from Alexander. Delgado Community College product is Alexander. Louisiana native, born in Baton Rouge. 68 runs batted in last year in the JUCO ranks. Oh, he's got those hands above his helmet on that swing. He's got those things way up there. Whenever I see hitters with their hands that high, the first thing I always look at is where do they get them to? Because nobody's swinging from all the way up there. If you can consistently get those hands from up above your head into the hitting slot down below your shoulder, you're fine. It's it's when you get stuck in between. It's a longer ways to go, but it doesn't matter where you start. Right, how quick does he need to be then when he starts bringing those hands down to kind of get him into that slot? Because if you're slow, it feels like you'd be behind. Well, it just depends on what your timing mechanism is. If you're a guy who starts early, kind of rocks back, you can ease them into that slot. but. If you're kind of a short late starter you got to get him there quick. It went hard on the ground to Cole makes the play to end the inning. Lead off home run by DeBarge. Tightens this one up. Got a 3-2 game. 2-4. Cougars three, Cajuns two as we go to the fifth, and those three runs for the Cougars scored on one swing in the second inning from Jonathan French. Batting with two outs, he was able to get one up and out, and uh, the Cougars had the first big blow of this game. Jonathan French did a really nice job pulling his hands in on a fastball that was supposed to be in, didn't get all the way in, and usually when you take that type of swing, you're shooting a line drive to right field, but Jonathan, Jonathan French shot one Halfway up the bleachers in right field. We sure did. Swinging a hammer there in the dugout. He's going to lead off the fifth. Got a note on French I think you're going to like. I don't know if I guarantee it. I just think it. But we'll see. We've got time. Now, first of all, he played for both South Carolina and Clemson. So, I mean, that's like playing for both Texas and Texas A&M. It's not easy to do. Yep. You're walking both sides of the fence. But in 2019, he was drafted in the 30th round by the Cleveland Indians. So the 30th round doesn't exist anymore and neither do the Cleveland Indians. So there is no 30th round. Now they're the Guardians. So someday he's going to tell his kids, hey, I was drafted in the 30th round by the Indians and they're going to say, what are you talking about? There is no 30th round. There are no Indians. It's like it never happened. It's like it never existed. He's never been drafted. <laughs> when you got to try and convince your relative, no, I was drafted. Listen, they had that many rounds then and they weren't the Guardians. They were the Indians. Trust me. When I when I finished my pro career there were still a couple of older guys who were 
around who could still say that at one point they had been drafted by the Expos. That's right. And some of the younger Wasn't Blummer play. drafted by the Expos? Yeah, Blummer was Blummer was an Expo. And that's an old guy, so there you go. <laughs> He's a really old guy. <laughs> but yeah, some of the some of the younger players thought it was hilarious anytime they would see somebody who had been drafted by the Expos at some point. Check swing. No swing. Wasn't Tom Glavin? Tom Brady was drafted Tom by Brady. the Expos. I'm sorry. Expo. Yes, that's where I was headed. Thanks for recovering. And uh, he was not the baseball player that Tom Glavin was. That's correct. I was thinking hockey, so I was going off this off script there a little bit. I think Glavin may have been drafted in the NHL. That's strike three. Carson Fluno, bogey now recorded, what, nine strikeouts? You know, there's been a significant uptick in Carson Fluno's stuff. This season and, and one of the things you look at is the strikeout numbers going up but also the batting average against it's almost it's over 100 points better than it was last season so he's going out there he's throwing a ton of strikes but he's just more difficult to hit this year. Well I would agree and this is Thomas Lysi who came on for Reynas and maybe he's a little bit dinged up we were wondering about Reynas after a couple of strikeouts so Lysi came into the game and getting his first A.B. here. Chopper. What a grab by Fluno. And then he recovers and throws a strike to first. If that blows over his head, it might die in the grass and be a no man's land. And he made the play. Yeah, I think you're right. I think if that ball gets over Fluno's head, they have no shot to throw Lysi out. But an athletic pitcher, who would have thought? Pitchers are <laughs> athletes. Maybe. That's pretty good extension right there. Well, that's a good thought. You know, and as Ace Reese steps in, it's it's Murray on deck. Now, he's a closer and a first baseman. I'm wondering if you guys, you dual baseball players, you pitchers and position players, whether you have a club, whether you get together and, you know, kind of scoff at those that simply just only pitch or, or play in the field. Those that can only do one. Yeah, one thing. I, I'll, I'll say this. You were a two-way guy. I, I was, and I'm always intrigued when I see guys at the college level. And even now, there's... Some guys doing it at the professional level, level going through the minor leagues just to see how it's handled because everybody's kind of different. Murray is a first baseman and a closer. You see a lot of guys who are starters and then will go out there and play out in the field. I just think it's fascinating how you manage doing both. And obviously right. Sho Shohei Otani is, is the benchmark for it. But the, because you get pushed in one direction or and, another. And, and, right? and it was always the, the story was always. Well, you can't do both because it'll be too difficult to be a full-time starting pitcher and a full-time position player at the same time. But then the open-mindedness that the Angels had when Otani came over to say, okay, maybe it's not 35 starts, but we can get 30. And maybe it's not 600 plate appearances, but it'll be 500 plate appearances. And, 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 and we'll dynamic at both. And we'll take that. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I really like to see how... The guys who do both manage doing both. There's a ball struck down the line in right by Reese. He's going to have extra bases. He might have more than two. This is going to go all the way to the corner. Broussard with a bubble. So Reese isn't going to stop on his way to third in there with the two out triple. Broussard was way over into right. He had a long run into the corner and then. Try to come up with that ball cleanly. It's a heck of a swing by Reese right there, flipping one down into the corner. But what I liked most was he made that decision to go to third on his own. As he's rounding first base, getting halfway to second, he can still see down into that corner. And as soon as he saw that ball kick out a little bit, he put his head down and knew he was going to third. You don't have to wait for the coach to tell Good you point. to stay or go. When that play is in front of you, when you can see what's happening, you're, you're your own base coach. Gunnar Leger, the pitching coach, on his way out to the mound before Justin Murray bats. And we were talking about Murray, the two-way prowess, and I'm with you. As someone who both played in the field, of course, and was a pitcher at, at Tulane, you're, you're a little bit intrigued by these guys like Justin Murray. But at the college level, I'm almost wondering if we might see a little more of a resurgence in that because you're talking about 11.7 scholarships. When you can impact a game and, and, and not take up two scholarships? Absolutely, and that's why at, at the college level and certainly at some of the private schools where you can't have such an expansive roster all the time. 
it, it's been really beneficial to have guys, even if you're not a, a starter on both ends, if you can just be a guy who can come in and eat up five or six innings here or there throughout the course of the season, it's valuable. Talking about Jack Caglione of Florida, another one that's dynamic with the bat. I like him more swinging than I do pitching, but it doesn't mean that he might not do both. And this is Murray. I would say the other day, though, Murray comes in, one run game, gives up a home run. So now you've given up your DH. And that's another factor, too. Absolutely. And, and, and it puts a little bit of pressure on coaches to manage the players within the game. But I, I think you'll take that trade off with having a guy like Justin Murray who can do both so well. Little chopper going foul up the third base side. And I've always been of the mindset of why choose one if you don't have to. Let the game decide for you. If you can go out there and be productive as a hitter and a pitcher, why would you stop doing one just because somebody yep. says you, you should? This is a guy who graduated Dartmouth in three years. I think he could probably handle a lot of things. Yeah, he seems pretty competent. <laughs> oh, two. A little bit high. Famous Astro Dartmouth player. Brad Osmus. OK, well done. I knew you would get that, but uh, you were quick. I watch a lot of the uh, Astros trivia that they do during the games. <laughs> Cougars would like to add to this 3-2 lead. I didn't realize Fluna was at 100 pitches. Is that right? That is not right, we're told. All right, well, that's what it said on the scoreboard, so. He does have nine strikeouts, so he's jumped up that count just a bit. Poke towards right. Broussard started in, and now the ball will carry over his head. Reese will score. Murray into second base. The Cougars have a 4-2 advantage. Second double for Murray in the game, and Broussard got a bit flat-footed there for a second. That was a misread by Broussard. You, what you want to do when that ball is hit, the kind of in-between line drive right at you, is freeze. You don't know right away if it's going to be over your head or in front, but you don't want to commit to one. Broussard took a step or two in. Once you do that, if it's over your head, you've got no chance to Well, recover. this has got to be a helpless feeling, right? It's the worst feeling. It's the worst feeling because you feel like you're running underwater, trying to get your momentum stopped and going back the other way. You just can't pick them up and put them down fast enough. Fluno at 86, and this might, uh, it will be it. That's the second visit. So he pitched well today, got nine strikeouts, couldn't get through the fifth inning. And the Cougars have a 4-2 lead. New pitcher coming on for the Cajuns. We'll step aside and come back with our new hurdler right after this. Always need a pronunciation guide when the Cajuns come to town, but I can handle this one. This is Chase Morgan coming on out of the bullpen. Lefty reliever for the Raging Cajuns. It's a fastball slider mix. Chase Morgan threw a third of an inning here on Friday night, so he's back in it feeling pretty fresh. His job right now is Trey Jones. He's got a big, strong left-handed hitter coming up. He's going to be pretty slider heavy in this matchup. We talked about how these games really most of the nine, with the exception of the Houston Vandy game, have been 
some high scoring offensive games and I guess if I've been surprised by anything it's been the inefficiency of some of these teams bullpens and I know these coaches and head coaches pitching coaches I'm not stepping out there too far in that gangplank to say there's some sleepless nights because they're just trying to piece together these innings you would think that with the quality of arms that are down there because we see some good stuff coming out of the pens but it hasn't shown the results and that's just part of the developmental process and once you start getting into the deep parts of these bullpens on a Sunday when maybe it's guys who haven't thrown big innings for you you never really know exactly what you're going to get every time somebody comes out of that pen Yeah, there's no doubt and, and Trey Jones steps in chance to knock home Murray and added this 4 2 lead. Takes a front door breaking ball for strike one. Sometimes I think you might go under the assumption that my guy might not be as sharp as I would like, but he can still get a couple of outs. There have been some guys that have come in and you're like, can they get an out before they're replaced? And that's when it starts compounding. Once you have to throw more than one guy to do what you thought one guy would be able to get you. If you're expecting one pitcher to come out and maybe get you through an inning and you all of a sudden have to throw three guys, mm. They're no longer available the next day, and, and it just creates more and more problems down the road. Yeah, you can see it kind of adding to the problems. And that's going to be strike three, so no need for a throw to third base. How about Morgan coming out of the bullpen, disposing of the dangerous Trey Jones and ending the frame? But Cougars get a run. 4 2 advantage for the U of H. We go to the bottom of the fifth. The Texas Children's Houston Open returns on March 28th through the 31st. Get your tickets to see the top PGA Tour players compete at Memorial Park Golf Course. To get your tickets, go to tchouopen.com slash tickets. You going to make it out there for the golf tournament? We got baseball. <laughs> well, you can you can do both, right? <laughs> go on for golf during the day. And have I'm a few going beverages. To I'm going to try. If, <laughs> well, the weather should be great. Golf during the day, opening weekend at night. It's a pretty good weekend. I'll tell you what, when I watch that Phoenix Open, it almost makes me wonder if I'm man enough to go out there and handle it with all the chaos. I don't, I don't know <laughs> if I could take Scottsdale on the, on the waste management weekend. <laughs> New pitcher coming on for the Cougars. Owen Woodward on to work here in the bottom of the fifth. Woodward low mid 90s fastball he's got a split that he's been working on this season and here's where it gets interesting for the Cougars. You've got the lead. You've got Murray and Tori Alba probably for the eighth and ninth. How do you get there? You, you, you've got a couple of guys down there that just have to cover these next three innings. Broussard is one for two. Cajuns down by two. That's on the corner strike three. That didn't take long. There's a lot of options that you can go to with two strikes, but a perfectly located fastball is always a good option, no matter what the situation. 
Jackson Halter is singled in two at bats. House won the way to the sweet level. Fifth appearance all time in this event at Minute Maid for the Cajuns. They're coming off a 41 win season, 18 conference victories. Still trying to figure things out a bit here in the first few weeks. And I think every team understands that it's going to be a process. If everything goes swimmingly in the first couple of weeks, you almost feel concerned that something will go wrong later on. I mean, there is a little bit of a build and a climb towards hitting on all cylinders later on in the year. But I will say there's a little bit of pressure when you're two or three weeks in, you're facing conference play soon, and now you feel like maybe there's even a few more unknowns than you thought. That's kind of the line of demarcation. It's when conference play starts. Everybody wants to come out of the gates hot and, and, and get off on the right foot, of course. But once you get into conference play, you really want to know who your guys are, what your identity as a team. And if you're still trying to figure it out at that point, it's going to be really tough. You don't want to be trying to mix and match while you're in conference play. And obviously those bullpen rolls part of that as well. 3-1 pitch fouled away. But it's never been more difficult. You, all throughout this weekend when we've talked to coaches, the overriding theme is we've got a ton of new guys. We're still in the evaluation process. It, it, they're bringing in lots of freshmen. They're bringing in tons of transfers. And yes, you get an idea of it in fall ball, but until it really starts, you just don't know. Was that the splitter there? Maybe not. They're calling it a sinker on the board, but yeah, that's the splitter. It had some run to it. There's no doubt or drop. Let's see it again. And that's just working away from the bat. Might have had too much velo to be the splitter. Regardless, this is Pastor. Obviously, these weekends are little different challenges that you're facing three different teams. I mean, when you're loading up for one team for three games, you feel like you've got them pretty well scouted going in and after a game, and that process starts all over in this event. And the, the three-game series, each game builds off of the last game. You can go and wear out a team's bullpen on Saturday and reap the benefits of that on Sunday. You don't get that necessarily here. Yes, it might work in your favor, but it also might, you might get the best of a team coming off of an easy game when you just spent a whole game before that trying to, to get it, your feet underneath you. Good morning, good afternoon, and good night. We've been wondering when somebody would step forward from the bullpen. Mr. Woodard did just that. There's some smiles in that Cougar dugout today. A 4-2 lead as we go to the sixth inning. We were talking bogey about facing three different teams in three days. And you know, in a three-game series, as you mentioned, you might wear a team's bullpen out on Saturday and kind of reap the benefits on Sunday. I think the flip side of that too is when 
you lose a couple of games in a weekend, you might come back with a more determined effort on Sunday where the team that wins a couple of games might kind of look past you. You've got two teams 0-2 really wanting a win here in game three. There's no momentum carryover, and, and you're not going to come out and be the more desperate team. You find yourself in a situation, both teams coming out here trying to get that salvage win. Leave this event with a good feeling. As Jimenez leads off the sixth inning. Morgan struck out the only man he faced in the fifth. So back out there and begins this inning. Woodward was fantastic in the bottom of the fifth. Three straight strikeouts. Cougars pick ninth preseason in the Big 12, but will be irrelevant pretty soon. And Jimenez takes the walk. Cameron Nickens next in. Game like this where the Cougars are winning but are still being out hit. The last thing that Matt Deggs wants to see is lead off walks. Yeah, even when we brought up that home run that French hit off Fluno, he was kind of resigned to the fact that there were free base runners on in front of him, and usually they find a way to come around one way or another and score. Solo homers don't kill you. Three run homers can. Well, foul down the line in right. A little bit high from Morgan. I've seen Morgan lose that fastball up a little bit. He was really good last inning when he came in, dropping that slider into Trey Jones. It'd be interesting to see if he goes to that slider to find his release point. There's your answer. There you he go. sure did. That was nasty. You know, sometimes you start losing that fastball up and you can't find it out front, that release point that needs to be out front to throw you a good fastball. The breaking ball will force you to do that. Poke towards right. In comes Broussard. He's got it. One out. Harold Cole next in. He's walked and singled and scored a run, swiped a couple of bases. Former San Jack player. I was over there about a week ago at San Jack. They've got a nice facility where they can work out, and you know, it's uh, pretty impressive. And obviously, they don't need the indoor here in Houston like some other JUCOs may around the country. Rich baseball tradition there at San Jack. They've certainly got a reputation for bringing in talent and developing them and putting guys either into D1 programs or putting guys into the draft. Uh, Jackson Rutledge a few years ago as a first round pick. That's a smash to third. Maybe a chance for two. Taylor's relay in time. Double play. The Cajuns go around the horn for the 5-4-3 DP. And just three men come to the plate in the sixth.
Are you allowed to wear a Rangers hat at Minute Maid Park? The gentleman's hiding right now. Not a bad idea. I can't talk. Okay. Sitting with a few Cougar fans. Maybe that allows him entry. My son came to the game uh -oh. today uh -oh. with my parents. So grandma and grandpa took my son to the game. He showed up with a Longhorns shirt and a Dodgers hat. Who's dressing this kid? Himself. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck for the next uh, several years. As Amade will swing and foul one back from Woodward to begin the bottom of the sixth inning. A Dodgers hat. It was his T-ball team a couple okay. years ago. Right. We don't well, buy that. We don't buy that kind of stuff in our house. That's what I. I was heading in that direction. I figure it had to be some type of team-provided apparel. Yes. Couple of ground outs for Lee Amade. Four, five, and six. Two up for the Cajuns in the bottom of the sixth inning. Hard hit. Nice backhand by Cole. A jump throw, a little bit like Jeter, but Murray brought his foot off the bag and safe is Amade, ruining what would have been a highlight type play. Nice play there by Cole going deep into the hole with the jump throw. Just couldn't quite get enough on it to get there on the line and to pull Justin Murray up. But it's why you run hard down the line. Even once you see that ball get caught, you go all the way because that foot's up in the air just for a split second. That was bang bang. Base hit for Amade, so it takes just one base runner for the Cajuns to bring the tying run to the plate. And it's DeBar to homeward at the edge of the Crawford boxes in left center, his last time in. Drives that ball in the air to center. I think he's seen three pitches, Brian, and he's going to fly out to center. You're right. That, that is, that's three pitches. That's three swings. And that one had just a little bit of it. It looked pretty good, but it had just enough cut to run off the end of the bat there. But that's still a good sign for Kyle DeBarge. He's seeing the ball well. He's getting off really good swings. He's timed up to the fastball, which if you're looking for a guy to start to break out and hit his stride, being timed up on the fastball is the number one thing you want to see. So John Taylor, the batter, one for two. He has one of the seven hits for the Cajuns. Cajuns have two more hits than the Cougars, two less runs in the column that matters. John Taylor, one of the returners, one of the guys they're going to lean on this year. You know, I've not been to Lafayette since they renovated the Teague, and I was there for a regional. And I think it was right before they did some serious renovations. But it's a great atmosphere. You know, they sing center field for the seventh inning stretch, and they scream it at ear-piercing decibels, and they have a pretty good time. They enjoy their, their college baseball. So I'm going to have to get back at some point. Yeah, I remember playing out there, and the combination of the trees out behind right. the outfield and then the fans and, and very vocal fan base being in the stands, it just feels like the whole place is closing in on you as an opposing player. And I think the renovations amplified that rather than took away from that. That's always the concern when you put some money into a facility. Will it lose its personality or identity? And I think if anything else, it kind of created an even better viewing those aspect. Are, those are the best places to play, places where when you go into a stadium, it has that pre-existing identity that you that you know and can expect. Wild pitch will send Amade to second. He just about spun his wheels too. It's a tough read. You can you can tell the angle from first base looking into the catcher. You can tell that it gets past, but you can't really tell the depth. You've got to wait a second to see a little bit of clearance between the catcher and the ball before you can be 100% sure it's not still at his feet. Well, that one just hit the calf of Taylor. Knocked him down. Get him on the kneecap at all, or did he just kind of twist himself into the ground? He pops up. I was concerned for a split second. Maybe he wasn't going to do so. 
Ooh, he gets just enough of a turn to keep it off the kneecap, but still gets right in that calf muscle. I tell you what, after a three-hour bus ride to Lafayette yeah, tonight. He's going to feel that for a few days. That's not going to feel good. Feels pretty good right now going down to first base, though. <laughs> Well, don't look now if Trey LaFleur launches one out of here. The Cajuns will have a lead. And part of the conversation with the Cougars is a new pitching coach and certainly a highly acclaimed guy in Sean Kenny. Then you mix in a guy like Woody Williams who's also available as a director of pitching strategy and development. You got to love the combination pitching coach you have different guys that you can go to and, and get different viewpoints it's not just mechanics it's not just feel for pitching you've got to be able to do both to, so to have two pitching coaches that have so much experience in, in all aspects of the game you can really get a well-rounded development as a pitcher yeah, I think that's well said give the Cougars a pretty good shot at developing these pitchers former Georgia pitching coach Sean Kenny Well, here's LaFleur. He's lying to right. Pop to first. Woodward gets a ground ball that's going to just trickle into right for a base hit. Amade around third. Here's the throw to the plate. Cut off. It's a 4-3 game. A sing eye single from LaFleur. It counts the same, and it's back to a one-run contest. It doesn't always feel like it as a hitter that the things always even out, but Trey LaFleur in his last at-bat hit a rocket to right field that got caught this time. Gets beat just a little bit, but puts the ball on the ground and finds a hole for an RBI single. Cole could not get there. So now first and second for Jose Torres, who's one for two. With the catcher at the plate, I'm sure the Cougars and Woodward would really love to get a ground ball at an infielder and a chance to turn two. Pick down to second base. And DeJesus had to contend with that uh, base runner, Taylor. This is a situation where, as a pitcher, you have to be really honest with yourself about what has happened. Woodward got what he wanted in a ground ball that wasn't hit all that hard. It just happened to find a hole. He's fine. If he can do that again, he's got a good chance to get out of this inning. Good pitch to Torres, who ran up to Chauvin and took strike one. It's hard in real time to diagnose whether or not things need to change. You, you, you can't just go off of the results. Runners are going to go. Little flare out into right, and it's going to drop for a base hit to tie the game. LaFleur to third. Runners are at the corners. You don't have to hit them hard to count. Back-to-back -back soft hits, and yet the Cajuns have come back to tie up this game at four apiece. That was a hit and run. Both runners That's were right. moving on the pitch, and Torres went down and took a slider down and away and just laid it out there to right field. So really aggressive call by Matt Deggs right there and a good job by Jose Torres executing. If he hits that ball harder, it's probably going to be a double play. But he dumped it in front of Jones. And Josh Alexander is the next scheduled hitter. And again, Woodward struck out the side in the fifth inning. He's given up an infield single, a hit by pitch, about a 20 hop single, and a little flare into right. Again, the results say it hasn't been very good, but the process that you would take those outcomes. Soft they've just, contact. They've just not found gloves. I think we've had a call already to the bullpen, so the Cougars are going to make a pitching change. Cajuns have come back and tied up this game in the bottom of the sixth. We'll, we'll be right back with a new pitcher right after this.
Cougs have gone to the bullpen. They're going to bring on this left-hander, Chris Stewart. Lefty reliever Chris Stewart, fastball, low 90s with a curveball. The thing is, is the fastball comes from a funky delivery. It's got some sink to it, so he can get a ground ball with that. He can get a swing and miss with the breaking ball, and the Cougars will take either of those right now. From the Netherlands, from Amsterdam, and you're Tulane educated, so why don't you take a crack at his high school for us? <laughs> Kellandalysium. That's well done. I don't even know if that's right, but I'm, I'm going to give you props for Sounds good, doesn't confidence. It? <laughs> a lot of letters. That would get you some points in Scrabble. That was interesting. Stuart went to throw and either caught his cleat or aborted the mission. He's going to inherit a couple of base runners and one out in the bottom of the sixth. Cajuns have come back to tie. Of course, Houston had a 3 0 lead after the home run from French in the second. Close to within 3-2, then 4-2, now 4-4. When I think about baseball players in the Netherlands team from the World Baseball Classic, usually it's the guys from Curaçao. That's right. It's not necessarily guys from the Netherlands proper. Caleb Stelly is going to pinch hit. A little bit of matchup right here, put in the righty for the lefty. And you have options right here if you're Stelly. That right side is wide open. We've seen the Cajuns hitting and running on a couple of different occasions. Would the they hit, dare do it here, too? The hit and run is certainly in play because you're staying out of the double play. Also, the push bunt to the right side with the infield and double play depth. And you can see Stelly really trying to pull his hands in, fight to stay the other way on this. Trying to work it into right field, put his team in front. See Harold Call playing for the double play at second base and Justin Murray holding the runner on at first, that right side wide open. Big wave of a miss from Stelling. Baton Rouge native. Family all LSU. Tiger greats, different sports, football, baseball. Played against them last night. Right now he's trying to give his Cajuns a lead against the Coots. A big chopper that's going to carry over the head of Murray and roll towards right. Scoring is LaFleur. Torres to third. It's a double for Stelly. The throw gets away. No further advancement. But for the time being, the damage is done. And Louisiana with a 5-4 lead. If you do your job and have a good team at bat, good things tend to happen. And Caleb Stelly right there, we said he was committed to hitting the ball the other way. Really got beat by a sinker and hit it so late in his swing that he chopped it to first base. But... The baseball guys repay him, and it goes over Justin Murray's head for a double. That's the third time today we have seen a big bounding ball past a drawn in infielder or one even with the base that has gone for a double. This is Broussard, one for three, and Cajun Nation is invested right now in this game. And that's the main argument against the three true outcome hitting. You can't account for good luck. Put the ball in play. Things happen. Tell you what, another base hit here, especially a soft one, will really have the Cougars talking to themselves because there's not been a ball hit hard this inning, and three runs have come across, and the Cajuns will take every bit of it. And now the one, two, and three spots have a chance to tack on. Broussard hits a little fister by the mound. Cole will charge, scoop, and throw, but another run scores. It's 6 4 Louisiana. Another quality at bat for the Cajuns. Broussard fighting to keep the ball in the middle of the field. The infield not drawn in. They were going to concede that run on a ground ball into the middle of the field. So pull the hands in. Do not roll over this pitch. And he does a good job shooting it out for the RBI. Another pinch hitter for the Cajuns. These teams really going to their bench here in the middle innings. Luke Juhas. You know, once you normally start complaining about all the soft contact is when somebody hits one about 110 off the bat. 
towards a fence. And if you're the Cougars, you really don't want that to be the case here for you, Luke Juhans. You've got to fight the urge to try to do more. The Houston pitchers are making pitches. They're getting soft contact, not getting the result they want, but you can't try to be nastier. You can't try to throw harder. That's when those mistakes you're talking about, that's when those happen. Fastball up and out. Two gone in the inning, four have scored. And Steli at third. Three and one. So Woodward, who struck out the side in the fifth, facing three batters, striking them all out, goes an inning and a third and ends up giving up four runs. So baseball's not always fair. That one stings a little bit. Backdoor slider for a called strike. This is almost unhittable when you can hit this spot. Well he did it again. Gets the K to win the inning. But the Cajuns will take a four run frame new game Cajuns up by two. We go to the seventh inning the Cougars once up three now down two and the Cajuns have made a call to their bullpen they're going to bring on their third pitcher of the game it's Jack Martinez. Jack Martinez coming in for another relief appearance he threw an inning on Friday night gave up the big three run homer but also struck out three so has some good stuff he's made some starts so he's got a deep repertoire he's got four pitches going to come out maybe try to get through one maybe two innings for the Cajuns. Now our cameras caught Martinez after he gave up that home run and you know he was not happy and uh, he took out his frustration towards his coaches and uh, in no uncertain terms did they let him know who was the boss. So I, you know it, for me it's encouraging to see him get back out there because I think you need a bounce back opportunity and one that obviously will kind of correct a few of the mistakes of this weekend. It's something that it's hard to understand if you haven't spent a lot of time on a team or in a clubhouse but things happen in the course of a heated competition that players can put behind them much quicker than people who've never been in that That's situation before. That's not going to work in your day job but it might work at a baseball clubhouse. Something like that doesn't often get caught on camera but things like that happen a lot more often than you would think certainly a lot more often than they happen in a traditional work type place so you're right not something that the coaches and the players aren't used to getting over and getting past and that's right a nice clean it. inning here will do a lot exactly De Jesus leading off eight nine and one by the way Broussard moves to center you who pinch hit is in right and Stelly who pinch hit is in left so it's an entirely different outfield alignment which might come into play considering these guys have not been out there 
at those spots for the first six innings in this challenging ballpark. You know that three run homer Brian gave Houston a lift early and it was three nothing in the top of the second but since that point the Cajuns have 10 hits they've scored six runs and now the Cougars are in a position where they've got to find something here offensively in the later innings. That's kind of been the story for the Cougars offense throughout this weekend they've scored in bunches but they haven't really been able to have extended periods of time where they've consistently put good at bats together. We saw it on Friday where they came out and scored a couple runs early and then the offense was really stale for the next five or six innings. They, they need to yeah. put more pressure on the pitcher. You get mistakes from pitchers when they're constantly under pressure and it can't just be one inning at a time. You've got to do it over and over and over. Coop fans a little fired up right now. So are the Cajuns. Both of these fan bases are feeling the importance of this inning and that's a leadoff walk and that is not what Martinez wanted to do. You know for a lot of D3 guys they might be kind of investing themselves in Jack Martinez at Trinity University and Sometimes you go to D3 you're playing for the love of the game and it's not always about an opportunity to move up and for a few there have been and this is French who had the big home earlier. I had a, a Pitt Maryland Washington Corpus Christi weekend in Corpus and there were a handful of D3 guys for Pitt some of those northeastern schools that were willing to take some guys who just had huge three four year careers. Maybe not as common though here in the South. Well and a lot of people think of the transfer portal as a negative too much jumping around too much having to re recruit your own players but there are guys that slip through the cracks going from high school to college and end up at a D2 or end up at a D3 or maybe they're just a late bloomer and it's good for them to have an opportunity to end up where they are supposed to be eventually. And this is a big time arm as he gets strike three on French. And this will be a help in the Cajuns bullpen in the Sun Belt Conference if Martinez can propel himself forward. I think we got a pinch hitter as well for the Cougs. Remember Reina started in this spot. And then Lacey was uh, put in the top spot. When he filled in now it's Alex Lopez now he didn't start bogey and I was wondering if we might see him at some point because he's been a key part of this lineup with uh, 32 at bats to this point. Now Alex Lopez has had a couple of key at bats over the course of this tournament for the Cougars offense a couple of big RBIs on Friday. There's his numbers on the season Lamar High School product McLennan Juco guy. 57 games though a year ago six home runs. And if you're thinking about a long ball you pop one out of here you're back to even again. Well that's the mindset. When you're playing from behind especially late. Just get the tying run to the plate that's all you can ask once you get to the tying the tying run to the plate. Anything can happen and. The Cougars put themselves in that situation early in this inning and now they've got a couple shots to capitalize. One on one out one ball one strike. Cougars batting in this seventh and that one hit foul down the line and right off the netting. Hey, Frenchie. Frenchie. Now with two strikes you see a little shift to the left for the infield and for the outfielders. A lot of mini shifting this weekend. For these teams. Foul right of the plate. Martinez ready his next pitch rides off the corner at ninety two. Martinez next one spikes that in the dirt that was a good stop by Torres. 
It's always nice as a pitcher to have trust in your catcher that you can throw your nastiest breaking ball, you can throw your best changeup and bounce it and ha not have it go to the backstop. De Jesus will not run, and that is ball four. So a walk, strikeout walk, and now the Cougars are in business in the seventh. Well, when we had Matt Deggs on earlier in the game and we were talking about that three run homer for the Cougars early, his comment was, yeah, we had a couple of free passes in front of it. Well, here you go, here you go again. Yeah. He's hoping it's not deja vu all over again. This is Reese and he had a triple in the fifth. And would score in a double from Murray and that is the last time the Cougars have scored in this game. Forward and answered by the Cajun since. And he came back with the breaking ball to dump it in for strike one to the freshman. Martinez spikes another one. Torres has had to really throw his body in a few of those. It almost looks like Martinez has a better feel for the off-speed stuff than the fastball. The fastball has been the one that's ended up in the dirt a couple of times. He's had a good feel for the breaking ball, dropping it in for a strike. If I'm Reese, I'm looking for that. And he missed to send the count to two and one. I don't know if he would qualify as a max effort pitcher, but he really does kind of try and generate some tilt leaning back and then firing to the plate. He's got a whole lot of front side coming at you. He's really You're pulling right. hard with that glove. We have a balk. No stop. And now the tying runs are in scoring position. Two walks and one balk. And that man's not pleased. A little concern maybe. Reese waits on a 2 1 pitch. That changeup has kind of fluttered a few times as well. That's dangerous. When, when you're missing up with the changeup, that is not a good spot to be. You want that pitch to be at the bottom of the zone for a strike or down out of the zone, not floating back up into a hitter's bat path. Hitters count. See if Reese gets something to try and drive. He does not. And the bases are loaded. Now the question is. How long will the Cajun stay with Martinez? Bit of a helpless feeling right now for the defense with those three walks. And the Cougars will have the two guys up that they would prefer with Murray and then Jones on deck. Gunnar Leger in his way out there. You know, you, you would think this conversation is, is two sided. It's trying to get Martinez calmed down a little bit, get him back into the zone, but at the same time telling him. Two best hitters are coming to the plate. Here's how we want to attack them. So it's a little bit of get you right, but it's also a little bit of this is how what we have to focus on doing to these next two guys. I was wondering if Martinez, when he saw Leger come out there, was thinking, you know, maybe they're going to go ahead and make a move. And then you get a great big hang with them, go get them. Justin Murray has a couple of doubles. Even with the three walks already in the inning, Justin Murray's not a guy that you're going to tell to go up there and take. You have to trust him enough to control the zone. Wave it a miss. A guy who drove in 58 runs last year, hit 11 homers, in addition to his 10 saves. Hey, Todd Whitting will 
trust Justin Murray enough to go up there and be able to aggressively attack something in the zone and still be able to take these pitches if they end up out of the zone. That's ripped to the gap in right center field. It's down. It's going to go all the way to the warning track. Two will score. Here comes Reese. That is a three-run double for Murray. And the Cougars are back in front. It's 7-6. That's the right guy in the right spot. Justin Murray is the exact hitter that the Cougars want, want to have up in that situation. And he gets a slider that backs up in the zone. He doesn't try to do too much with it. Just lays the bat out there and stays to right center field, splits the gap for a three-run double. So a three-run double after a three-run homer earlier, and the Cougars are making their hits count. They've been out hit 10-6, but they lead 7-6. Still only one out this inning, and now we will see a move made, and that'll do it for Martinez. He's going to make the putt of the bullpen, and the Cougar dugout with some life. Top of the seventh inning. Houston in front, 7-6. We'll be right back. Cajuns have gone to the pen. The left-hander Stephen Cash summoned into this game in the seventh inning. See Cash, the lefty with the low three-quarters delivery, fastball slider, changeup. Going to be really difficult to pick that pitch up. He was really closed off, and they brought in a lefty to face Trey Jones last time with good results. Looking for the same outcome here. Hey, a new attendance record here at Minute Maid, more than 61,000 plus. Record was set back in 2022 in the middle of a big league lockout when LSU and Texas were also part of this event. So I think we thought we were on our way. 61,379 new tournament record with almost 15,000 today. So well done. Very well done. And it just speaks to the fan bases of all of the teams involved, just the general college baseball fan base, and also just how much the city of Houston loves baseball, professional and college. I would agree, and it just continues to build on this reputation in this event. This is Trey Jones against the left-hander. Did he offer on that bunt? He did. He stabbed at it enough to get strike one. You see that funky delivery from Cash. Not an easy guy to stand in against as a lefty. And obviously Trey Jones thinking along the same lines as somebody with the, the power that he has to square around a bunt. Just one out this inning. Big wave and a miss by Jones. I'd like to talk some baseball with Trey at some point. His great-grandfather played in the Negro Leagues, and I'm wondering how many of those stories got passed down. Oh, I hope the a family lot of them. I do too. Anytime there's tradition baseball tradition in the family you hope that it just gets passed down generation to generation maybe some mementos or something from that uh, that time that league
Trey's pretty good with the guitar though. Didn't he perform it? Maybe the anthem on his guitar in Corpus Christi. So he's multi-talented. I think he did it for senior day last year in Corpus for Coach Malone and the Islanders. All right now he's trying to play one into the gap for another hit and add to this Houston lead. They were down 6-4 and things were a little bit listless and that's changed. Waves and misses and he's seen a lot of breaking balls from the lefties this weekend. That's kind of been the book the last couple of days for Trey Jones. A lot of soft stuff but still you have to execute those pitches and nobody's out there hanging breaking balls to Trey Jones. This is a quality slider down and away and when it's coming that far across the zone the whole way it looks like it's a strike. Trey Jones can't help but take a swing at it. Jimenez the DH is 0 for 1 but he's been on base a couple of times trying to pick up Murray from second who had the big blow this inning with a three run double after three walks loaded him up. Cash the fourth pitcher used by the Cajuns it's a wonder he didn't throw that one into center that was the best play of the night by Taylor the second baseman to go retrieve it. Looked like a miscommunication there usually. Pitchers waiting on some type of signal from somebody to spin and throw but Cash just went on his own. What they're trying to cut down in baseball right now is that. Lollipop throw which kind of allows you to reset they will really want a legitimate move well in making a legitimate move and just go ahead and, and throw the baseball they almost threw it away. <laughs> Yeah, I think at, at some point when he spun and got his head around and realized that there was nobody there at second base, there was probably a second of panic. Of, yes. I've got to throw this ball. <laughs> I think you're and right. I don't know who I'm throwing it to. <laughs> I'm going to put it out there and hope somebody goes and retrieves. Now it's three and oh. Boy, it has been tough to start accumulating three outs in several of these innings late in games. And it doesn't matter if it's Vandy or LSU or Texas or Houston or Louisiana. They've kind of followed a similar pattern in that's ball four. That's the fourth walk this inning. And it's always fresh. It's frustrating as a coach. It's frustrating as a pitcher. These guys are out there. They know what they're supposed to do. They know they're supposed to go out there and fill up the zone with strikes and let the defense work behind them. But guys just cannot find the zone this inning. Everybody checking their watch right now. Taurus looking down still looking down. And the clock's at six they had to step off. And Gunnar Leger out this is the third time he's been out there this inning. But you saw Torres he was looking at his watch cash was looking at his watch and there's nothing these 18 to 22 year olds like more is to look at their phone or their watches or <laughs> their iPads but uh, something wasn't working. Well the pitchcom system is supposed to make everything easier but when guys are looking at the watches and not understanding what they're doing and pitchers are picking off when nobody else is covering the base sometimes you might just want to throw some fingers down there and go. I think the Cajuns are going to go ahead and make a pitching change. How about that. So Cash. Will exit new pitcher coming into the contest. A revolving door out there in the bullpen. Cougars up 7 6 back with a new pitcher right after this.
third pitcher of the inning for the Cajuns. It's Blake McGee. Blake McGee, four appearances this year, four and two thirds innings, so he hasn't gone long in games, just about an inning per appearance. But right now, the Cajuns will just take somebody who can throw strikes and. If you're Blake McGee, you got to go out there and just start to fill up the zone because they need to cover a couple of innings here. They do. Face four batters in the sixth inning against Vanderbilt on Friday. It was an early 3 0 Cajuns lead, but the Commodores came back to win the contest 7 4. Cash faced the two batters, and Nickens set to face McGee. So five base runners this inning for Houston. One hit. Nickens is 0 for 3, scored a run. He reached back in the second in front of that three run homer by French. That one poked to first. Hard bounce. LaFleur will take it. They'll bring it back to the bag to retire Nickens. And that didn't take long from McGee, but the inning itself was a lengthy one. Cougars get a handful of runs back in business, up by one. Bobby the engineer is up there somewhere. You know a couple of years ago when I was uh, working a game for YouTube through the MLB network I went up there in game and Bregman Homer and I got to tell you when they shoot off the fireworks and you're up there it's loud. No oh, I bet and you're then getting, you go for a little ride. You're getting that reverb off the windows up you there are. probably gives you <laughs> concussion. I interviewed Bregman after the game and I said I was up there in the train for your home run and he gave me one of those looks like are you serious. Why. Yeah well I know I was trust me I was up there. <laughs> New pitcher for the Cougars as this game begrudgingly moves into the bottom of the seventh. It's Jose Torrealba, native of Venezuela. The veteran lefty, one of the reliable arms out of the bullpen for Todd Whitting. He's been around small in stature, but big time stuff. The fastball's 94 95 from a low arm angle and really jumps on hitters and a good, sharp slider. He's going to be. Paired up with Justin Murray here somehow between those two they'd like to get through these last nine outs. So to do that you'd like some quick outs or some efficient innings. And Pastor in there takes a strike. I think you saw the Venezuelan flag on the back of the glove there of Tori Alba but he's going to work against. Three four and five. Cajuns had the four run sixth. Cougars had three in the seventh. This is a big inning for the Cougars too. If you can have a quick efficient inning here. Theoretically you can go without having to see Pastor and DeBarge again after this inning. Good point. 
That's a quick beginning. Three pitches and a strikeout. And Tori Alba's got one of those fastballs. The low arm angle, but he really gets behind the baseball, and it gives that illusion of jumping on a hitter. It almost feels like the ball's rising because it's not on as much of a downward angle as you're typically used to seeing. Yeah, just seeing that last replay, almost kind of like a whip-like motion coming out of that hand. Fastballs like that play really well at the top of the zone. Even if they're not high 90s blow you away velocity, it just really jumps up above the bat. He reminds some around the program of Shane Nance, and I had Shane at AAA, little lefty, Arizona Diamondbacks, Dodgers, and uh, still see him around the ballpark a lot or at a volleyball venue, but uh, Nance had maybe more velocity than you would think out of a guy that's 5'8", 5 5'9", 5 and Torrey Alba the same thing, and he's ahead in the count one and two, and now the Cajuns are fired up. <laughs> They've been on plate on by Ron Teague, who I think has had a pretty good zone tonight, but... Uh, Maybe they've not agreed. A little bit outside. Well, I think it worked. That last one looked right. pretty good right there. But th th there have been a couple pitches the last inning or two down at the bottom, bottom of the zone that neither side has been okay. happy with. And a 2-2. Two -two. Maybe we're just nine games in and thinking about how these pitchers have kind of struggled to throw strikes at certain points. <laughs> we'll, we'll take all the strikes we can get. Well, there might be a little bit of that. By the way, Lopez is at third as well for the Cougs. Payoff pitch. Big chopper. Murray going far to his right to come up with it. Race to the bag. Safe. And that was a tumble by Murray. We've seen that about four times this weekend where a first baseman has gone so far out there that he's tried to get to the bag himself rather than flipping it. And I don't know if Tori Alba was even in position to take the throw. Now, Tori Alba with that whippy delivery as a lefty, he's falling off towards the third base side. So he's always going to be a step or two behind. And Justin Murray, he goes far to his right to scoop this ball. But then when he comes up looking to make the flip, Torrey Alba's not there. And Ooh. did he a, get him? That was closer than it looked. That last replay gave me something else to look at because that's close. But I think the runner got it. But got that's, that's a tough decision to make for Murray right there. Obviously the fastest thing to do is run through the base like he did. That's what we teach base runners. But you also want to slide to protect yourself. You don't you, want to get trucked. When you cross that base and you're extended like that, you leave yourself exposed. It's, it's a good thing he came up healthy. Well, DeBarge had seen three pitches and three at-bats. He'll get at least two here because that one went to the backstop. So that was the only one he hadn't swung at yet. And then he gets hit. And the free base parade continues. And my thought was when Amade got on with the base hit that, you know, that's one that off the bat you're thinking, well, that's an out. Then it isn't. And all of a sudden now there's a couple of guys on base and only one out. Things can speed up quickly. And the, the benefit of having a veteran pitcher out there like Torrey Alba is he can take a deep breath and, and hopefully slow the game down a little bit. But you went from having... A quick strikeout and a quick ground ball, but you don't get the out. Now all of a sudden you're in trouble. Taylor smokes one to right for a base hit. It's down, held at third base. Will be Amade. And the bases are loaded with one gone. Cajuns continue to do their best work at the plate early in the count. Taylor gets a fastball that doesn't stay down in the zone, kind of stays over the heart of the plate and puts a really nice swing on it out in the right field. And Trey LaFleur, the batter, came up with a couple of guys on base in the sixth and got an RBI single. Hit about a 20 hopper between first and second. Sean Kenny paying a visit to the mound for the Cougars. You were just talking about how I'm sure they would prefer a combination of Torrey Alba and Murray. Well, now you're in a strange spot where you're just trying to get Torrey Alba through this inning. It's definitely not going as planned for the Cougars pitching staff. But yeah, right now you can't worry about the eighth or the ninth. You've got to get out of this seventh inning quickly. They're going to make a pitching change. So. 
Toriyama struck out the first man he faced before giving up three straight base runners. We'll step aside. Cougars onto their fifth pitcher. Left hander Brendan O'Donnell inherits a bases loaded mess here in the bottom of the seventh. Brendan O'Donnell, the senior lefty, big, strong kid, fastball slider combination. He's got a lot of energy, kind of pitches on the edge a little bit. You hope that he can keep that all focused. Coming into a situation with the bases loaded, you don't want a guy coming out there seeing red. You want that energy, but you want it to be really focused as well. UConn transfer. Brendan O'Donnell. Tori Alba struck out Pastor quickly to begin the seventh inning. Then it was an infield single on a ground ball that looked like off the bat might be an out. Hit batter, base hit. And here come the Cajuns again. In the matter of four pitches, it went from a quick out, here we go, and four pitches later, the bases are loaded and you're out. It, it can snowball quickly. Cajuns about hit the Cougars 12 to 6, but they trail by a run. Free passes will kill you. And there's been a lot of them in front of That's the right. hits for the Cougars. And sometimes you can get away with kind of scattering walks over several innings, but they have come in bunches in these games. Start walking two, three guys in an inning, you're just you're asking for crooked numbers. So a lefty lefty matchup for Trey LaFleur is one for three with an RBI single. First pitch. It's a wave and a miss. LaFleur continuing the aggressiveness of these Cajun hitters willing to hack early. Knocked down by French. It's a good job by Lafleur. He chased that exact same pitch. First pitch, tightens up his zone a little bit, lets that one go. Now he's got to look for something up. It's going to be more sliders than fastballs. Probably you've got to wait for one that stays up in the zone. Thinking left field. Front door slider for strike two. That's a good pitch. Such an effective pitch. If you can start it at a hitter's hip, your natural reaction is going to be to freeze, and then all of a sudden it starts breaking back over the plate, and you know you're just locked up. I would worry about hitting him with the bases loaded, and then he spikes that one again, two and two. We've seen a 14 to 11 game today, a 10 to 5 contest, and now it's 7 6 with, I would imagine, more scoring to come.
Swave and a miss. That's a huge sequence. LaFleur, Deno strikes. That's a perfectly located slider for Brendan O'Donnell. You want to get it close enough that you can entice a swing, but you don't want to leave that pitch over the zone and, and give yourself a chance to give up a cheap hit. Just perfectly located down and away. Trey LaFleur has no chance of touching that pitch. I would agree. Well executed sequence. Now it's Jose Torres had an RBI single back in the sixth. It's two of the 12 hits for the Cajuns. Jonathan French is earning his scholarship back there today. He's blocking seemingly every pitch that's coming in and is bouncing. It's a combination of having a lot of base runners and a lot of pitches in the dirt. So everyone feels like it's important to smother, knock down. Of course, the tying run 90 feet away, so you don't want a freebie. And that's a little bit in. So now he needs a strike. Falling behind Torres to at home. Outfield and infield straight away against Torres. O'Donnell's next pitch. Big hack. Fouled it right back. I think I took the mask off the helmet to French. Two outs in the inning. The Cajuns haven't scored yet. Down a run. Bottom of the seventh. And that is a little bit out, maybe a little bit low. It's a good take right there by Jose Torres. He gets the call, obviously, but even if that pitch is called a strike, that's not something that you want to go after. That sinker down in a way you need it to be more up, more on the plate. Huge pitch here. Three ones, not close. Ball four, tie game. This is Steli. Remember, this is not your normal number nine hitter. He pinch hit in the sixth inning, got a big bounding double over the head of the first baseman Murray down the line, and then he stayed in to play left field. <laughs> the Cougars going to make it into pitching change, I believe. They need the three batter rule like the major leagues. I think has. you're right. We're getting pretty close to that maybe at some point. This is pitcher number six coming on for the Cougars. The 11 in the game will step aside. Tie game 7-7. Seven, seven, bottom of the seventh. Tell you what, if we had a dollar for every pitcher we've seen today, we could take Ryan Dollar out for a really nice lunch. It's been a parade <laughs> from the bullpens. 
late in this game, but Ryan Dollar, he's coming in in a tough spot. He's got the bases loaded. The game's already been tied. He has to throw strikes, obviously, but at the same time, you don't want to lay one in there and give up the big crooked number. So not a whole lot of margin for error coming in in this spot. You know, we went to break. You mentioned the three batter minimum. It's amazing how the new rules of Major League Baseball have trained us to when we see different pitchers coming in every one or two batters, how we find that a little bit jarring comparing, compared to what we've become accustomed to. It's been a long time since we've seen multiple pitching changes over in one inning at the major league level because you have that three batter minimum inevitably the inning ends before it kind of gets wacky and out of hand but when you're able to change batter to batter matchup to matchup makes a lot of pitching changes it's a lot Cajuns have tied things up here in the bottom of the seven and Steli will hit with the bases loaded and two outs. An RBI double and his only at bat of this game. Righty righty matchup and dollars first one is off the corner but on the appeal the check swing is called a strike says Michael Banks. Still he didn't care for that. I thought maybe he had checked. Steli was a little bit late getting back into the box and he hadn't made eye contact with Dollar so our plate umpire Ron Teague jumped out there and made sure that they did. Now it's nothing in two. Couple good breaking balls early by Dollar gets himself ahead in the count now. You've already gotten a couple of chases why not give it another shot or two and see if he'll expand. So coach Deggs is going to use an offensive timeout here to kind of slow down the uh, momentum of dollar. I think this is more about trying to put pressure on dollar than it is any strategy at the plate. No, there's no doubt. It's just to break the rhythm of uh, dollar after two quick strikes considering maybe, the magnitude of this AB. Maybe let him stand on the mound look around a little bit see all the runners on base. Ball punched to cold at second and that will end the inning so the Cajuns. Get a run to tie, but they leave the bases loaded. We go to the eighth in a 7 7 game. Seven seven top of the eighth inning. Gun to the bullpen yet again. Matthew Holzhammer is the new Cajun pitcher. A lot of activity here in the last couple of innings and a lot of pitchers as well. But Matthew Holzhammer working on a back to back he threw last night it's not all that common to see a college pitchers throw on back to backs but just a third of an inning last night he's got good stuff he's got a fastball that moves arm side ninety two ninety three miles an hour and a good 
side to side slider. And at this point, both coaches are looking for somebody who can just get in, in there, throw strikes, and get through an inning cleanly. This is 12 pitchers, and we're on the top of the eighth inning. They're still. We're not done. I mean, you could envision a lengthy game. Remember what happened in the. Uh, Don't say it. Yeah, ninth <laughs> game. Well, I'm, I'm going for the opposite jinx of that, but it was what, 18 innings last year in the ninth game? Yep. Finished at 1 a.m. Fingers crossed. Harold Cole leads off the eighth inning. Of course, what they've done this year at the College Classic is put a runner at second base in extra innings. And I think for these type of events, it's really important to do so. There have been a lot of times when I've seen that ghost runner at the major league level and just not liked it, but. You'd be all in favor here. Kind of happy yeah, that no. it's. <laughs> just, yeah. if, if, if the 10th inning is looming, I'm happy it's there. Cole is one for two. Get into a double play as last time in. Tell you what, that bottom of the zone has tightened up quite a bit by Ron Teague after he's heard about it a little bit from both sides. Holzhammer needs a strike. Gets one there. Popped up, foul ground, first base side, and it'll be out of play. So from three and out to three and two. Cougars want some base runners. Another pop up, same spot. Guy went and retrieved that foul ball and might get another one. See if he stays in that spot. See if he can get three in a row. Yeah, why not? I mean, thanks traveling threes. Cole has spoiled a couple. And that is a little bit in for ball four. Cajuns were wondering if Cole may have offered, and now they will appeal, but no swing. No strike. This is how most of the offense for the Cougars That's has right. started tonight. It started with walks and then big hits later after that with a lot of runners on base. But these rallies for Univer University of Houston, they've all started with three passes. This is DeJesus. Having said that, Brian, how much are you willing to sacrifice now? And as I say that, it comes immediately, considering that you might put yourself in a position where you could draw more free passes. That's the question. And I think you're just at a spot in the lineup when you're probably willing to do that. The other question that you have to ask yourself is, is one run going to be enough to win this game? If we're playing for one here, are we confident that we don't need three or four more to win this game? I think you're onto something. <laughs> De Jesus already squaring. Now he'll pull the bat back. Off and rolling is Cole, and he's safe at second with the base. That is his third stolen base of the game. There's not much you can do as a catcher when your pitcher is a 1 4 or 1 5 to, to the plate, and you see Harold Cole get just such a big jump that. Even a throw that's on the money is just not going to get him. So now De Jesus, a bunt will still work to get the runner over to third, but you also could give yourself a chance to swing and maybe get him over to third or punch one through the hole. Stabbed at that bunt attempt. By the way, Cajun pitchers tonight, in case you're curious, I know you are, they've walked seven and they've hit about it. They may not be done with that total either because three base runners have been the problem. Tied at seven, eighth inning. Now with two strikes on De Jesus. See what he's able to do. 
Wave and miss. Holzhammer gets the K, and that's always the frustration when you don't get that button down, that when you get a chance to swing away, that it may end up as a strikeout. It's a really difficult position to be in when you don't get the bunt down, because in your mind you think, well, I've already failed. But the thing is, is the at-bat isn't over, and it's hard enough to hit, but to hit with that in the back of your mind makes it almost impossible. Jonathan French had a three-run homer way back in the second inning to start the scoring. He struck out twice since, and he takes strike one from Holzhammer. Ground ball off the glove of Holzhammer, and it's going to propel into right. Here comes Cole. He's going to score the go-ahead run, and the Cougars have an 8-7 lead. Well, go ahead and pick your teammate up. DeJesus doesn't get the bunt down, but Jonathan French immediately makes up for it and hits one hard up the middle. The deflection sends it out into right field, and you know, if you're the Raging Cajuns, you got to be sitting there thinking, man, that, that's bad luck that that ball goes in there, but you walk seven and hit another guy and you're leaving that much traffic on the bases, bad luck is going to compound. Want to take a guess of how many of the seven have scored of the seven walks without cheating, without looking? Six. Five, close. Yeah, it, it, it never fails. Alex Lopez walked and scored in the seventh, his only plate appearance. Still only one gone this inning. Lifted towards the Crawford boxes. Back goes Stelly. Leaps. It's off the wall. Propelling back to the infield. French, the catcher, will be held at third. He was just about tackled there. And a double puts runners at second and third off the bat of Lopez. Well, Alex Lopez has swung a pretty good bat throughout the course of this tournament. Comes in the game late and goes to the opposite field off that wall out there and left. But... How about Brian Broussard? He's the guy, the center fielder is the one who ended picking, ended up picking that ball That's up. That's amazing. As Steli goes up there and loses it behind him and that ricochet comes off, Broussard is coming to back his teammate up and that saved a run for now. He had such a long path to get over there. He was a little bit to the right of the batter's eye. Went all the way to left field to retrieve that carol. And you know what? You can't do that as a reaction. You can't see the ball carry him off the wall and left and then come over. That was a reaction off the bat. And I would guarantee you that Brian Broussard has made that kind of reaction a hundred times and it's not paid off. The ball hasn't bounced to him or the catch was made. And then all of a sudden the one time that it shows up, it pays off. Saved a run for the time being as Ace Reese bats. I've seen times when shortstops have gone out there on plays like that if they're playing in the hole or deep where they start to leak out towards left. There's a couple different spots here in Minute made where the shortstop comes into play out in the outfield. One is the hard carom off the big wall out there in left field. The other is the carom off of the little cutout in foul territory down the left field That's line. Right. If it kicks off that, it's coming straight, straight back to shortstop. Straight back along the chalk. Hey, we're going to Look at a new pitcher. Pitching change. I'm running out of slots in my score column. <laughs> eight seven, eight inning.
Well, left-hander Blake Marshall comes on out of the bullpen, and this is pitcher number seven for the Cajuns. Blake Marshall, the lefty, you get the fastball slider combination, but most important thing you're looking at for at right now is can we throw strikes? There's been so many walks for the Raging Cajuns today. Four walks in just two and two thirds for Blake Marshall on the season. He's he's going to need to go in there and throw strikes, but at this point. Everybody's just emptying the bullpen. As soon as somebody shows up and can show that they're going to get out, they'll just ride them as long as they can. When a game like this takes place, do you think there's the tendency when someone issues a walk or gives up a hit where you say, let's just go get somebody else, as opposed to kind of settling in maybe in a different scenario where you might let him see if he can extricate himself from his own mess? Well, the score would leave you to believe that there's no margin for error, but the problem is, is every time you go down to the bullpen there's no telling what you're going right. to get out of there and if you have a guy who clearly doesn't have it on the mound by all means go out and get somebody new but there's no guarantees especially with 19 20 year old kids coming out of that bullpen well said here's ace Reese Reese has walked and tripled and scored a couple of runs infield in all the way around Still only one out this inning. Runners at second and third for the Cougars as they look to tack on to this 8-7 advantage. Ace Reese has had a couple at bats like this throughout the course of the tournament this weekend where RBI situation a lefty has come in to face him. He's going to get slider, slider, slider. I'd like to see him really set his sights on left field here. Good pitch on that outside corner for a strike. Everything's going to be away. They're going to try to establish the outside corner and then walk you off. You've got to look out there. If they can throw strikes by you on the inside corner, so be it. You'll still be quick enough to get to a mistake breaking ball. Strike on the inside corner. That's the one you'll give it to him. So what? Got to stay out over the middle. Because I'm guessing he's going back away now if he just came in. We'll find out. And if he goes back in now with two strikes, maybe you try to fight it off. You can do what you got to do, but. Elevated and a wave and a miss and a strikeout. That's a big second out of the inning. Well, that ball had some carry, didn't it? It's a tough pitch to lay off of when, when you're going to get a lot of breaking balls. What are you thinking? You got to see the breaking ball up all of a sudden. The fastball up out of the hand can't lay off. Is there anybody left in the bullpen? <laughs> Cajun's about to bring on pitcher number eight. We're only in the eighth inning. I say only, but 8-7, Cougars in front. We'll be right back. Well, here comes JT Etheridge on a pitch in this eighth inning. We're just playing matchups now. It's going to be lefties for the lefties, righties for the righties, and JT Etheridge 
fastball slider combination. So with Justin Murray coming to the plate, he's going to go out there and look for that strikeout. He's got seven strikeouts in just four and two thirds. So there's some swing and miss in there for JT Etheridge. All right. Now with runners at second and third. And Murray, a dangerous hitter up there, had the three run double in the seventh and he's had three doubles in the game and four RBIs you could just put him on and leave Marshall in to face the left hander Trey Jones who struggled with lefties yeah Marshall was thrown through the ball well in the one batter that he faced and with what Trey Jones has done so far today with the three strikeouts that would have been the matchup that I would have thought about you could even go and throw Murray a couple pitches out of the zone to see if he'll chase him first that slider drifts off the corner there's there's ways to get the matchups that you want without just bringing in new pitchers to get the matchup. Especially with what how, if you walk Murray anyhow <laughs> and how sp how sporadically pitchers have thrown strikes so far today. Blake Marshall came in and threw the ball pretty well. You, you knew he was out there throwing strikes. No telling what JT Etheridge has today. Well, he's missed on all three and again even though this is right on right we've seen Murray do his damage I'm pretty but, sure uh, Justin Murray can hit a right handed pitcher I'm pretty sure he can I've seen it <laughs> did a lot of it in fact he's green light here by the way oh. 93 at the knees. Cougars have scored a run this inning on a single by French to regain the lead. 3-1. Lifted to left center, and this ball will be caught by Stelling. So the Cougs strand a couple of runners in scoring position. We go to the bottom of the eighth. Houston up 8-7. I think I saw a couple of yawns there from the man on the right. He's hanging in there. <laughs> so are we. I thought you were talking seven. about me. Well, no, he, the <laughs> gentleman on my screen. But you may have as well when I was focused in on him. And Tyler is going to begin this inning after he finished last frame and got a bounce out from Stelly. So the Cajuns scored a run but left three in the seventh. Cougars scored a run, stranded two in scoring position in the top of the eighth. Top of the lineup, Broussard, Juhaz, and Pastor. Broussard singled way back in the first. He's one for four. He drove in a run with a ground out in that big inning, the four-run sixth for Louisiana. Upstairs at 94.
on the ground to short. Gabala, no throw. Scoop by Murray, and Broussard retired. Broussard catch that ball way off the end of the bat. There's a lot of movement on that breaking ball from Ryan Dollar, but really it's the change of speed. That fastball, 94 miles an hour, and the breaking ball down all the way 81, 80 miles an hour. So a big 13, 14 mile discrepancy. That's a lot of velo to cover as a hitter. This is Connor Higgs. Going to pinch it for you, Hans. Couple of defensive changes as well. Shane Vogel is in center field and Nickens now in left. We have long since passed what has felt like a spring training game when it comes to pinch hitters, pinch runners, defensive changes, and 15 pitchers. My scorebook is a mess. 14 pitchers. I'm jumping ahead. We'll get there. Don't <laughs> worry. <laughs> two and two to Higgs. He's going to wave and miss. Ground out, strike out, two quick outs in the Louisiana eighth inning. Well, this is the exact start to an inning that Ryan Dollar is looking for. Good fastballs, good breaking balls, a couple of quick outs. It's been something that hasn't happened for a while now is a quick two out, nobody on inning. You're right. Get the Cougars back up there and batting in the ninth. Pastor is 0 for 4 with a couple of strikeouts. It'll be interesting to see Dollar gets out of this inning. You assume Justin Murray as the closer would be the guy for the ninth. Is he going to run down to the bullpen? Is he going to come play catch on the side during the inning? Is he just going to throw it around really hard yeah, on a couple of strikeouts? <laughs> <laughs> he might have to. It's a strike. I tell you what, if Dollar retires past door, I'd be tempted to just keep this rolling. You find a guy that's dealing, let him deal. So we got a foul tip into the glove of French. He's really confident with that breaking ball, dropping it in for strikes, throwing it for a swing and miss, still in the zone. If you can get swings and misses in the zone with the pitch, really easy to go back to it over and over again. Yeah, working with some tempo as well. Once you get ahead in the count, that one fouled back by Pastor to stay alive. Cougars would like to see a perfect bottom of the eighth to shorten this game. What an inning for Dollar. Ground out, strike out, strike out. Cougars inching a little bit closer to their first win this weekend.
Ryan, you said this game might not reach the ninth inning, and I kept telling you, I bet at some point we do. Have Here we are. Right. Well, I, yeah, you would think. <laughs> Doesn't always feel like it, though. <laughs> All right, so Steli has now moved to right and Higgs to left. So we have had three different left fielders, three different right fielders, and two different center fielders for the Cajuns. That seems like a lot. Trey Jones leading off this ninth inning. When you're an outfielder at practice during BP, they always tell you, make sure you're getting fly balls at all three positions. <laughs> make sure you're comfortable everywhere. They didn't say it was going to be all in one game. Yeah, one game. Someone's got a lineup card probably posted in that dugout, and it is every bit of mess. With You're running out of spots to put people. Tell you what, though, you look down into both bullpens out there. Still more There's humans. There's still a lot of people out yep, there. There's still available bodies. And Jones is 0 for 4 with three strikeouts. He's probably happy to be facing a right-handed pitcher, not a lefty. You spoke it into existence. There's more activity rolling out there in the bullpen. Way high and back to the screen. In these last couple games, Trey Jones hasn't really produced a whole lot at the plate, but I tell you what, he hasn't gotten anything to hit. The pitchers have pitched him really tough, kept him off balance, changing speeds, a lot of really well-located pitches. And then late on that one. Might have been looking for the breaking ball, and he goes down on strikes. He's that, seen so many of them. That's what happens after two days of soft, soft, soft. All of a sudden, you get stuck waiting back a little bit, and then you finally get yourself a fastball to hit, and you're late. Can't speed up quick enough. That's got to be one of those frustrating stretches when you're between pitches. It's a bad place yeah. to be. Bad place to be. It's, traditional thinking is you get timed up to the fastball you adjust to the off speed there are some really really talented hitters who can sit soft and adjust to hard but it's a really hard thing to do it but if you're in between you're not getting either that's a bad bad place to be Jimenez with a count of two at home this one just about got him Ooh, too late in the night for that Two and one now to Jimenez. Batting with the bases empty and one out in the ninth. A couple of 0-2 teams this weekend desperate to get out of here with a victory. And they have played like it in these last few innings. Slider for a strike. Etheridge, the eighth pitcher used by the Cajuns tonight. A lot of real estate down the line and left, and Higgs won't get there. If he's playing in a normal position, that's a catch. Instead, it's going to be a double. One of the funky things about Minute Maid Park is that cutout at the end of the Crawford boxes. As a left fielder, that cut isn't in what would be considered straightaway left field, but you typically want to play with that right behind your back so that you know if I go to my left, I have room behind me. If I go to my right, I'm running into that wall and it puts you out of position a little bit because that's a ball that hung up. That's a ball that wasn't all that far from the line. It's just the, the positioning gets you. That's a good point. And after Jimenez gets the double, Craig is going to pitch run. This is Nickens. 0 for 4, trying to pick up some insurance for the Cougs. And takes one in for Methridge. Pitches a strike right around the belt over the inside corner. You get a little J.R. Tolls look to him right there. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Going back at Astros lore just a bit. 
What was it? Nine RBIs? Yeah, he did it in, in St. Louis. Game? I think he homered off maybe Aaron Hicks at the end. Position player. Really? If I'm not mistaken. I know yeah, it was a position it was, player. It was like the first week of games that he played in, too. That's right. I think they want this pitch up. Not that far up. It's going to go to the backstop. Torres was holding that glove up there, but he didn't want it above his head. And now just a fly ball would provide some insurance, and it's going to force the infield, I would imagine, to come in. You're going to have to play it in. This, this run, if you can prevent it at all, you've got to do everything you can. Just so difficult cutting down on the infielder's range on a guy who's pretty good at putting the ball in play. Fastball missed. The count has gone full. Etheridge has been firm with that fastball. What will he throw here? Goes with a slider, gets the wave of the miss, and that's a big pitch for out number two. That's a good slider in a tough spot. Cam Nickens thinking 3-2, definitely going to come with the fastball, but with the base open and a runner on third, you're not necessarily married to having to throw a strike, and Etheridge went and threw his best slider. Good one indeed. Harold called the batter. He's stolen three bases. He's scored two runs. He's walked twice and singled and hit into a double play. So it's been a busy night for Harold Cole. Cougars trying to tack onto this 8 7 lead. Foul ball back to our right into the upper deck, deck and then landing back downstairs. Craig comes darting down that line of third, doesn't matter. Cole will wave and miss, and Etheridge gets the three strikeouts this inning. So, on we go. Bottom of the ninth inning. Cajuns need a run to tie and two to win. We go to the bottom of the ninth. Cajuns need a run to tie, two to win. Maybe some pensive Louisiana fans there. Going to have the four, five, and six spots due up. And as we wondered, Brian Dollar is going to go back out there, retired all four that he's faced rather than Murray. Both teams have spent most of the second half of this game just looking for somebody who could go out there and get outs and. Ryan Dollar has done that, so Todd Whitting not afraid to just ride him out. Chance for one pitch and one out if this one comes down out of the rafters, and Jones will make the catch, and Hamade retired, and there's one out for DeBarge, and this is the, the dangerous hitter right now for the Cage. Most dangerous hitter in the lineup, and he's been swinging the bat really well. What you have to know, and I'm sure was talked about on the bench before Ryan Dollar went out there, is that Kyle DeBarge has been super aggressive early in his at bats probably going to see the best breaking ball that Ryan Dollar has first pitch. Well done. 
And maybe even DeBarge expected that himself. I would think so. You know, after you swing at the first pitch two, three times in a row. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, good Lord. The sprinklers have come on here at Minute Maid. Apparently that timer goes off at 11.28. Sprinklers, yep, there we go. Look at Trey Jones, he's in the perfect spot. He's got six sprinklers around him. None of them are. He's untouched. None, none of them are spraying him. Well, we can't be in a rain delay indoors at the ninth inning of game number nine, can we? I mean, it's kind of funny now, but if they keep going off for a period of time, it's going to create some issues in the outfield. Yeah, at some point they're going to have to wait for it to dry off, especially if one of those warning tracks gets muddy. Somebody flip the breaker, flip the switch. I say play on. That might add an element of <laughs> a challenge or two here. Just play. If, if it's in the sprinkler, it's an automatic double, and we move on. There you go. I might take that as well. <laughs> well, I've run out of words. There we go. That's worth a Bronx cheer. Or a woo. You know, they come out and they drag the field during the middle of the game. Once you hit, once you hit four hours, the sprinklers go That's on. That's right. Just a brief interlude to this ninth inning. See if it slows down Ryan Dollar, who got one out on one pitch. And here is. DeBarge back in there and a chopper foul outside of third base, so it's one and one. Another aggressive swing by Kyle DeBarge. Looks like he's sitting on that breaking ball at this point. Wave it a miss at the high one. So he gets the fastball, but it's in a spot where he can't do anything with. Well, and that's kind of playing off of pitch to pitch and how things set up. You see that good aggressive swing that DeBarge took to a breaking ball. That means that he's looking for the breaking ball up, which means you're susceptible to the fastball higher than up. He just took out a few of our friends to the right here in the booth. Be no more replays. We lose those guys. <laughs> well, can't have that. The one two pitch. That's a swing. That's a strikeout. And Dollar continues to get out. He's retired all six that he's faced. Well, he's been great ever since he came in, and that was probably his best sequence, starting to barge off with the breaking balls, then elevating and showing him up, and then going back down to the breaking ball, down out of the zone. Just a really well executed at bat for Ryan Dollar. It's up to John Taylor. Last chance for the Cajuns. Couple of hits today. Louisiana with 12 hits to Houston's nine, but they're down a run. Remember, they lost by a run yesterday to LSU. So they have been some very close games, and of course, it feels like there's been multiple chances for both of these teams here tonight. Fouled right back, so. Taylor and the Cajuns down to their final striker out in the ninth, and the shift will go into full force now with two strikes. That's Alex Lopez that leaves third base and goes over to the right side for the shift to leave the shortstop in his natural position. One ball, two strikes, two outs. And the pitch from Dollar is up and out to John Taylor. The floor is on deck if Taylor can keep this game going. And a 2 2. And now he's in danger of putting a base runner aboard.
Count has gone as far as it'll go, and the payoff. Base runner for the Cajuns. And it's up to LaFleur, who has hit a couple of home runs this season. Driven in a run tonight. First base runner against Dollar after he had retired the first six he had faced. You don't want to put that tying run on in a free pass. You want to make them earn their way because now you have a guy in the floor with big time power and just one swing of the bat can not just tie the game, but now it can beat you. Robichaud pinch running at first base. Cougars are deep in their outfield, but Brian, I got to tell you, I almost expected them to be another step deeper to try and cut down a ball in the gap. Yeah, that's the no doubles defense. You want everybody to be back far enough that number one, you're not going to get burned on anything over your head. You can cover your spot all the way back to the wall, but at the same time, if a line drives hit in the gap, you want to be able to cut it off before it gets to the warning track and give yourself a chance to get that double cut to home. But maybe the sprinkler has kind of negated that extra roll. <laughs> a little slick <laughs> out there. You, you don't want the, the ball will hydroplane all the way out to the gap. Can you believe this? Now Murray is going to close. He's not warmed up. He's taking off his sleeve. He is going to throw on the mound. And after Dollar retired six in a row, issued the walk, he got ahead of Taylor. But uh, let him slip away. Now we will see Murray. All right, we'll be right back. 8-7, ninth inning. So Justin Murray, the first baseman slash closer, is onto the second roll. And he needs a final out to get a save. He was greeted with a home run, the first man he faced Friday. It's got to be in the back of Justin Murray's mind what happened on Friday, but he's got to move past it, go out there and execute good pitches, because the guy standing in the box right now, Trey LaFleur, he's dangerous. A long ball wins it for the Cajuns. And now as that ball squirts away, that's the last thing Houston wanted because a base hit now would tie things up. That's a big 90 feet right there. And now it's not necessarily the home run that you have to worry about. It's just a base hit. Just anything that's finding green with two strike with two outs is going to score the run from second. And that can't happen right there. You just can't provide that free base. 2-0 pitch outside ball three. Are you pitching around him now with first base open? I mean, you don't want to put the go-ahead run on. Not pitching around, but pitching extra carefully. Right. Now that the base is open, you don't have to give in, but you certainly don't want the winning run to be on first I base. I wouldn't think so. That pitch in there for a strike. It's Torres on deck, hoping for a chance to bat here in the ninth. We talked about having trust in Justin Murray at the plate earlier in the game. This is where you have to trust the veteran pitcher. 
to know the situation as well, to know that he's still attacking Trey LaFleur in a way where he's trying to make quality pitches to get the outs, but also not giving in because the base is still open. Second time the Cajuns have been down to their final striker out in the ninth. Can Murray end it here? The payoff pitch, swinging a foul at the plate, and the game remains alive. Pretty good slider right there by Murray, and an even better emergency hack by Trey LaFleur. He kind of froze on that breaking ball, had enough to just kind of pop it foul. Fifteen pitchers in this game. Will Murray be the last? He spiked that one for ball four. So the tying run is in scoring position. The winning run is at first base. Twice the Cajuns have been down to their final strike. And now that no doubles defense that we talked about becomes even more of an issue because you want to be at normal depth because you want to be able to take away the bloop base hit because you don't want that to score a tying run. But at the same time, you don't want one swing to split the gap and then the game's over. Jose Torres drills one to center. That's a base hit. Robichaud around third. He's going to score to tie the game in the bottom of the ninth inning. A two out walk, a wild pitch, a walk and a base hit. And we've got a brand new game. Jose Torres has been swinging a hot bat ever since he came in and pinch hit last night and just gets him a pitch up in the zone, not trying to do too much. It's a good compact swing to shoot the ball back up the middle. And now all of a sudden, a base hit wins the game for the Cajuns. And it's Caleb Stella. He didn't start the game, but he came on in the sixth. A blown save again for Murray. And I'm not sure if you look at these teams that have failed to put games away or whether you look at the offense's ability to keep coming back. It's a lot of both. It's a lot of both. When you have these big back and forth swings, it's not just one thing that causes it. A chopper to third, a foot race to the bag, and out. And we're going to extras. Of course we are. We are going to extras, tied at eight. Nothing has been decided in the first nine innings. Twice the Cajuns down to their final strike. Got the run to tie. So now we're going to put a runner at second base. And for the uh, Cougars, it's going to be the speedy Harold Cole. Brian, he's already stolen three bases in the game. So you would think this would be a bunting situation, but you do have some options. You definitely have options, and it's difficult to be the team hitting in the top of the inning in this ghost runner situation because you don't know if one's going to be enough. There's a distinct advantage to being the home team and knowing exactly what you need going into this inning. Bunted foul right at the plate. But I think when you look at the outcomes of Kobe DeJesus at bats throughout the game, moving the runner up 90 feet here probably 
an outcome you can live with. Remember, he tried to do that, though, his last time up in the eighth and couldn't get it down and then ended up striking out. He always, struck out three times And today. I always like in these types of situations, maybe giving the guy the first strike to try to move the runner with a swing, hit a ground ball to the right side, because maybe it finds a hole. Pick back at second. Safe, barely. You think about how these offenses have failed so dearly to execute when they haven't been given free runners. And now you're in a spot where you have to execute or try not to make any mistakes. And clearly safe as Cole, unless he came off the base. And then you also have a situation where DeJesus is trying to give the Cajuns an out. Will they be willing to take it or were they going to potentially put him on with balls out of the zone? There's a bunt push towards third. And the out is recorded. The floor came so far in, he was about ready just to shake the hand of DeJesus. So DeJesus, I think, sensing that, poked it to third instead. And that's why when you're trying to move the runner to third base with the sacrifice, the bunt goes to third base. You want the third baseman, when the play is there, to have to come and field the ball because that first baseman has the free charge. Just like when you're trying to move the runner to second base with the sacrifice bunt, you want it to go to first because the first baseman has to hold him on at first. Well, French has knocked in four runs. Infield in. And the inability to keep free base runners off the base pass has been a big storyline in this game. It does reinstate the possibility of a double play, but uh, nonetheless, just feels like when we've seen more traffic, it, it means that's when the crooked number's coming. It's never a good thing, yes. You can live with the fact that now the double play is in order, but at the same time, for the Raging Cajun pitchers, nothing good has come from the free passes so far today. Lopez didn't start the game. He's doubled and walked and scored a run since. Good bat to have in this spot. The pitchers down in the dirt. I hope the Cajuns don't have any early classes on a Monday. Better not have an 8 a.m. tomorrow. It's going to be a difficult one. It's rare, of course, to play a Sunday night game unless it's part of an event like this. Otherwise, it'd be an early game. You'd be out. You'd be traveling. There's usually a rule, like a drop-dead time when you have to be done by. Bouncer towards second. Can they get two? There's one. On to first. Double play. The Cougars do not score in the 10th. And now they can win it with a run in the bottom of the inning. So now it's up to Diego Lazardo out of LaPorte, Texas, on the pitch in the bottom of the 10th. Of course, he'll inherit that uh, ghost runner at second base and trying to keep this game tied and send it on to the 11th. Diego Lazardo is one of a couple of freshman arms that Todd Whitting is really high on down in that Cougar bullpen. I'm actually surprised that it's taken this long to see him tonight because he's got a big power fastball and Fastballs play no matter where you are. 
so often with that ghost runner you almost anticipate a team scoring at least once and when they don't when the Cougars hit into that double play now it feels like the advantage certainly goes to Louisiana but you can get a strikeout early if the bunt's not recorded if they don't try and sacrifice that momentum I swing back. And this is why there's such an advantage to being the home team in the ghost runner situation because now Louisiana knows exactly what they need and that's just one. So now the sacrifice bunt is certainly in play and if you're on the University of Houston side you've got to always keep in mind that there's always going to be a next play and what I mean by that is go out there and go for the strikeout right here in the first hitter. If you don't get it if you happen to walk the batter well then they're going to come in and sacrifice bunch bunt which is fine because then you can put the next runner on load the bases and have just keep playing the game keep yeah. playing for the double play you just keep playing for the strikeout or the double play strikeout or the double play hoping that eventually you get what you're looking for. All right here's Broussard. We have had some twists and turns in this game as well. Tied at eight, bottom of the tenth, ghost runner at second base. That is Stelly. And that pitch is outside. So at any point, are you not completely bunting or are willing to either pull the bat back and force Lazardo to take a strike or think about slashing or anything? I think the slash is in play depending on what the infield does. Justin Murray is getting way in at first base which means the second baseman is having to vacate his position to cover if you see Harold Cole leave second base too early to try to get over to cover first base all you have to do is pull it back and just touch it to the right side and it's game over Murray's really charging from first and he's going to handle the bunt he's going to look to third he's going to throw to third and it worked the one place the bunt couldn't go is where it went that's why that bunt has to go to third base because Justin Murray is just selling out. He's daring the hitter to pull back and slash. And when that ball was laid down to the right side, he does a nice job coming in, fielding it with his backhand and throwing a strike over to third base. Anthony Rizzo is the best that I've seen doing that. Come in, charge a ball, and then make the throw to third base. It's not just about fielding the ball it's delivering a strike because it's always going to be a bang bang play. Boy, what a waste of a ghost runner by not being able to get that bunt down properly to move the runner and now it's up to Connor Higgs. He pinched it in the eighth he said one at bat he struck out. He does have one home run. Oh and two. It's amazing how quickly these teams have wasted their ghost runner in this inning. It's a freebie. A three pitch strikeout. That's just a power fastball by Diego Lizardo. It's 93 to 95, but there's a little bit of jump on it. He kind of cross fires, and you can see that, especially the left handed hitter there, picking that ball up real late. That's another thing that came in to account on the bunt by Broussard is that crossfire action on the fastball everything going away. It's a tough pitch to get around and hook to third base. Pinch hitter for the Cajuns. This is Pusho. One homer and five RBIs on the season. I beg your pardon. Pastor back in there. Had a different player thrown up on the big board, but it is Pastor. He struck out three straight at bats, 0 for 5 tonight. So maybe he's due if the Cajuns. Need a big swing, but now they're going to have to try and do so with a runner at first and two gone. There was a time in this game where we just couldn't seem to get anybody out and stop the runners from scoring, and now we're getting spotted doubles and can't get anybody across the plate. Off and running is Broussard. Doesn't matter. It's ball four. 
So now the winning run is back in scoring position with a little bit of work. Lee Amade had a couple of infield base hits and a pair of runs score. You know, mentioned we earlier, he's not your prototypical cleanup guy, but more of a contact guy, and he has a chance to win it. And we talked about that no doubles defense. Now when a bloop base hit can beat you, I'd be surprised to not see these Cougar outfielders move in a little bit, especially with this power fastball. You don't want one on the fist to drop in in front of you for, no, to lose block. the game. I think the Cougars, <laughs> someone said I had school tomorrow or I have work tomorrow. And uh, these teams are going to play on. I think there was a check with our plate umpire whether there was another mound visit. And at this point, I, I'm not sure who's still keeping track of that, but if, apparently if, they had one. If you could run out, I think we'd be out by now. I just wouldn't want to lose the game on a pitch that we beat the hitter on. Right? If Diego Lizardo runs one in on his hands and he bloops one over shortstop in left field, I want to at least have my outfielder have a chance at getting that ball. I'd be a little bit in from normal depth. Amade can win it for the Cajuns. Good pitcher, strike one. Remember, the bases were empty, two outs, bottom of the ninth, down a run. It went walk, wild pitch, walk, single to tie the game. Cougars hit into a double play in the 10th, did not score. The Cajuns lost their ghost runner, but now they've manufactured a couple of guys on base. That pitch hit him on a swing. I think he offered. So instead of a HBP, even though it hit its foot, it's a strike. Full swing, pitch hit him. And it actually turned into a perfect bunt down the third base line. Mm. That is the definition of the back foot slider. Well, that one hurts in multiple ways. Now the count's 0 and 2. It's down. Broussard represents the winning run at second base. And the one two, they came back with it again. He swung it two pitches, one that hit him and one that almost hit him. And these teams just really wasted their opportunities in the 10th. So we go to the 11th. Well, we go to the 11th, and we have another new pitcher in the game. This is the ninth for the Cajuns. Senior Brendan Mooney, Moody, sinker slider combination guy. Got to go out there and throw strike one here. Get a feel for what University of Houston is going to be doing with that ghost runner on second. Are they bunting and playing for one? Are they going to try to go for the big inning? What you certainly don't want to do is have it end up being first and second, nobody out because you walk the leadoff hitter.
Hey, we're still here. That's still Brian. I'm yep. still Brett. We share the same birthday. Hard to believe he's younger than me, I know. Well, February 18th, guys, yep. correct? There Happy you go. birthday. Happy belated. Indeed, you too. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get together next year. We'll share a cake. We may still be here next year at that point. <laughs> <laughs> a couple minutes we'll be one day closer to That's our right. next birthday we'll be advancing here's the bunt and bunted foul This is Shane Vogel at the plate. Lopez is the runner at second base. Corners again charging. And Shane Vogel will pull the bat back and take one outside. Tell you what, with the lefty up, sinker righty on the mound. I don't know that you don't give him a shot with the with the whole right side of the infield being vacated. Just roll over one. He's pulling that bat back. So the ghost runner at second base to begin the 11th inning. There's the bunt, third base side. Shot put it over to first in time to retire. Shane Vogel. As Lopez moves to third. It's a well executed bunt by Shane Vogel right there. That's what we said. You want the third baseman to have to come field it. Get that early bounce. Give your runner a chance to get a good jump. And now you've got a man on third with less than two. Happy Monday. The witching hour. Infield in for Murray. This is usually reserved for the Astros West Coast games. That's true. When you're doing the pre and post or the post game at the late hour. Those games I'm very thankful for the pitch clock. Murray batting in a key spot again. Little tapper towards third. It's going to stay fair. Murray is going to reach, and he's going to turn and go to second base. He's going to get an RBI out of that, but the ball was also thrown away, and the Cougars are back in front. Well, Teams haven't bunted well, but you can have a swinging bunt. Put the ball in play. Good things happen, and... Alex Lopez going on contact right there. So as soon as that ball is hit and put on the ground, he's off to the races. No play for Amade at home and really probably no play really for him at first base either. Fourth hit, fifth RBI for Murray. Now it's up to Trey Jones to see if he can put a second run at least on the scoreboard this inning and that second run is massive with the ghost runner coming in the bottom bottom half of the inning as well takes the sacrifice bunt completely out of play almost went through the legs of Jones just one out here in the 11th Big chopper to the right side. Jones is going to reach. A sliding catch by LaFleur. And the second run will score. Murray never stopped running. Good, by, good job by Justin Murray there being aggressive and scoring on that play. But second baseman deep in the hole and goes get it and trail of floor almost had enough time to come back and get to first base but sliding into first justin murray sees that trail of floor is on the ground and just 
keeps running and there's just no chance for Lafleur to make that exchange and turn and throw home. I think the best chance of getting the out at first right there would have been Moody to continue all the way to first base. But as soon as it went over Lafleur's head, he turned and went to back up home. Now Jones running, but he's safe. Arbolita is pinch hitting. So now it's 10 to 8 Houston as Jones gets the stolen base. Remember the Cougars lost their DH when Murray came on to pitch. Arbolita California native Orange Coast College product. Ground ball up the middle. It's in the center for a base hit. Jones around third. The throw to the plates cut off and it's a three run 11th inning for Houston. This is what the Cougars have been waiting for. They've been waiting for the floodgates to open a little bit. A nice job there by Arbolita. What you want to do as a pinch hitter, you don't want to let a fastball go by. If you can go out there and just get timed up to a heater, end the at bat right there. He does a good job. He gets one out over the plate that he can handle, put a good swing on that sinker, and just drive it back through the box for an RBI. Now it's up to Nickens to keep things rolling. Three runs home this inning. You know, Arbolita played at Orange Coast College. That's where Coach Altabelli was for so many years. Former Cougar who lost his life with uh, Kobe Bryant in that helicopter crash. And uh, can't help but think of him every time Orange Coast College comes to mind. Arbolita, though, making the school proud with a base hit. So it's 11 8. And now I guess you. Just keep piling on because if the one thing we've seen teams have been unable to kind of finish off games. No lead has been safe this entire weekend and especially today. So you got three you might as well go for four. The real question becomes you've got a. Freshman reliever who finished off last inning for University of Houston. He's now sitting in the dugout waiting. How long are you going to be willing to let him sit before you think about going to another reliever who's been up and throwing in the pen? All right. Here's another thought process. Murray's still in the game. He can pitch again. I don't see why not. Of course he can. He could blow two saves in the same game. <laughs> You didn't think that was possible, did you? He could blow a save and get a save. He didn't throw that many. He didn't throw that many pitches. Why not? Certainly didn't have to waste any warm-ups. Uh, I think Lazardo's good enough. He didn't warm up. <laughs> You're right. He's, he's got bullets left. Not only have we entered Monday morning, we've entered the bizarro time. I think what's going to happen now these teams haven't been able to score so right now the Cajuns won't even be able to get out of this inning in order to get back up. You go from. <laughs> well it's kind of what I expected. There's a football there's some weighted balls. And uh, maybe some snacks someplace. It's a lonely place to be. They've used nine pitchers. There's been a lot of activity out there but. Not anymore. Harold Cole will bat. The one out this inning was the one that was provided with a sacrifice bunt by Shane Vogel. Eleven eight Houston. Eleventh inning. I think I'm on to something. You go from can a team stop another from scoring to can they score? And now that they've scored, can they even be stopped long enough to get the Cajuns back up at the bottom of the 11? And now you're in the situation with this Louisiana bullpen where you don't have a choice. I don't think. Brendan Moody, he's, he's all you've got left. And for better or for worse, you're going to have to stick with him at least for a while. A pitch off the corner to Cole, three and one. 
Reinforcements are on their way. I would say full sprint. And that's ball four. So that is five straight base runners after the sacrifice bunt. I think we're due for a mountain visit of some sort, aren't you? Just to settle down moody. I say both tongue in cheek and somewhat serious at the same time. As much as the Cougars would like to continue to score, at some point to actually win the game, they're going to have to go back out in the field. We, we had a game in college. It was a Sunday getaway day. We were the home team. East Carolina was the visitors. And we had the, the getaway time. And we had to finish the inning by a certain time. We, we had gone ahead in the bottom of the inning. If we didn't finish the inning by the drop dead time, it reverted back mm. to the previous inning in which we were losing. So we were out there trying to make outs to end the game before the time, and it actually ended out ended with one of our players striking out and us celebrating as he struck out. <laughs> <laughs> it was about as backwards a thing as I've ever seen on a baseball field. <laughs> That's Bizarro. Here's the one two to De Jesus. I don't know about that right there. You get, I think you've got to go right after De Jesus nibbling now once you're heading the count. Well, De Jesus, the guy's three strikeouts, That's a walk right. and a sack bunt. He hasn't put a ball in play today. You, you go you've, got to, you've got to attack him. And then he rips one into left for a base hit. Chasing home a run and maybe two. And it's a five run, 11th inning for the Cougars. Give DeJesus credit for the two-run single. And now you feel bad for Moody because it's been a parade of the bullpen, and quite honestly, there is some activity going, but he's just sort of lost it here in the 11. And, and not because of anything that he's done. He's just in a situation where he's the guy who's just going to have to wear it. It's going right. to take It's going to take his pitch count getting run way up in order for him to be out of this game. And French will wave and miss. It was the little swinging bunt by Murray that was an infield single and RBI then thrown away by Amade that I, I think was one of the tilting factors in this inning, but there have been several since. Wild pitch moves up both runners. I think the reliever in the bullpen, whomever that may be, the potential 10th pitcher for the Cajuns, has had enough time to warm up if he is called upon. A five run, 11th inning for the Houston Cougars after both teams botched their opportunities to score in the 10th. You don't often see a zero put up in these ghost runner innings, let alone back to back zeros put up. But it was only a matter of time before the floodgates opened back up the way the two these two teams have pitched today. New pitcher coming into the game. 13-8 Houston in front.
I bet when this day started and the Cajuns were hanging out around the hotel that Phil Brenneman probably never envisioned pitching on a Monday morning in the 11th inning after midnight. I bet when this inning started, <laughs> Phil Brenneman didn't well, envision touche. pitching because he was in the dugout when the That's inning right. started. He just ran out to the bullpen about five minutes ago, immediately started throwing. He's thrown a third of an inning this year. He becomes, by the way, the 18th pitcher in our game. That's it? Feels like more. Whew. Tell you what, he's got a little left-handedness in him, doesn't he? He's kind of bouncing around and... He's thrown with the wrong hand. He's spinning and twisting of. when he lets one go. He's all juiced up. Spinning on that leg of his once he's warming up. He throws like his hat should be just a little bit cocked to the side. I think he says he's ready to go. We'll find out together. We're actually going to have an inning where the ghost runner might then bat. It's no longer a safe situation for Murray if he wants to come back in and <laughs> And go for, and try it again. Try it again. <laughs> Infield in. Here's French. First one from Brenneman, not close. See how willing French is to. Take a hack at this pitch. And a hit batter will continue the inning. And here comes Lopez, who was the ghost runner, is not going to bat. And this is a situation where Torres, the catcher, for Louisiana, you've got to set up middle. Like, don't worry about corners. Don't worry yeah. about locations. Your location over the plate is middle. If you miss a little bit to the side, great. Split it right down the middle. There you go. Lopez bounced into the double play to end the tenth, and the Cougars did not score. And I would say if there was a win probability in the game, it swung to the Cajuns dramatically, and yet the Cajuns didn't score either. But the Cougars have in this eleventh with five runs. Bases full of Cougars. I'd say that's close enough. <laughs> you and I are thinking alike <laughs> right now. Mr. Brenneman just about had a strikeout. Instead, the count one and two to Lopez. And again, didn't miss by much, but off the corner. Lopez waiting, Brenneman pitching. Soft little flare that is going to be caught, and it's going to be a double play. Call was either locked up or thought there were two outs. Maybe they were just trying to end the inning. I think Harold, I think I think a bull a call came in from the booth here. 13-8. <laughs>
We go to the bottom of the 11. Cougars up by five. And sometimes pictures are worth a thousand words. It's that type of day. Only one word. <laughs> Tired. <laughs> How about Lopez both grounding into a double play, scoring a run as a ghost runner, and lining into a double play in two innings? It's been busy extra innings for Alex Lopez. Hopefully he can <laughs> get a ground ball right at him here. Hey, how about our 19th pitcher of the game? Grayson Drezik. It's his second appearance of this tournament. One of the more veteran pitcher leaders down there in the bullpen. A guy who, in a situation like this, you've got to think that Todd Whitting has trust in him. Don't worry about the ghost runner. Don't worry about any kind of base runners that go on your job is to go out there and throw strikes. Don't let that tying run get anywhere near home plate. There are Cougar fans saying amen to that. And DeBarge is going to lead things off with a ghost runner at second base and the Cajuns down five. Cajuns have still not hit the Cougars in this game, despite trailing 13 to 8. Tabar had a homer way back in the fourth. Two hits so far this evening and this morning. Our morning game became an afternoon game. Our afternoon game became an evening game, and our evening game became a morning game. DeBarge hits a home run here. Does it count as hitting a home run two days in a row? I think you make a point. You'd have an argument of some sort. Uh oh, high in the air, down the line and left. This one might find its way to the Crawford boxes and it's gone. A lead off two run homer with the ghost runner. Don't go anywhere yet. He homered last night. He homered this morning. A two homer game, and it's 13 to 10. Last couple at bats for Kyle DeBarge, they've really tried to work him up and down, and that was a fastball that was up at the top of the zone that he's able to get to. He's got a short, quick, compact swing, and when you're that direct to the baseball, it makes it a lot easier to get on top of the fastball at the top of the zone, and he got just enough of that to drop it into about the third row of the Crawford. What boxes. was the launch angle on that thing? Steep. This is Zambo, the pinch hitter. Just two more base runners, by the way, and the Cajuns will bring the tying run to the plate. You know, I have to ask, what was wrong with Lazardo when he was pitching last inning? Why not run him back out there? The only thing that I can think of was it was That's a right. long they had a hit layoff. It, there you go. Because they lost the DH. National League Baseball. Once Murray came on to pitch. Ripped a right. That's down for a hit. One more base runner in the tying run comes to the plate. Here comes a mound visit. And 19 pitchers, was it enough? How about 20? 20 pitchers. When was the last time you saw 20 pitchers in a game? I would guess never. Ever? You know what? Maybe winter Ever. ball. When you play winter ball, they get to reset the rosters every day. So you have a full bullpen of relievers every day so had to be a winter ball game 13 10 bottom of the 11.
Tim Williamson becomes the tenth pitcher for the Cougars. So there's been some symmetry. Each team has had ten appear in the game. What's your degree of confidence he will be the last pitcher in this game? I'm not very confident. Okay. I, I have I a feeling so. that Tim Williamson coming in here, lefty matchup against Trey LaFleur, good or bad, this might be just a one batter matchup, but if you're Tim Williamson, you got to know that the tying run is still not getting into the batter's box, so there's no reason to be overly careful with anybody. Still have to attack these hitters. So the Cougars had five runs in the top of the 11th. They had the bases loaded when Harold Cole just took off from third on a soft liner to short. So it ended the inning. Who knows? They might have been able to score more. So you're pretty comfortable if you're the Cougars with a five run lead. Ghost runner, homer, single, pitching change, and here we go. It happens quickly, and if if this inning goes sideways, that play at the end of the top half of the inning that we kind of thought was going to be a non-factor could end up being huge. It comes much more so. Lefty lefty here. LaFleur in his sixth plate appearance. He bats seventh in this lineup. A combined 27 hits and a combined 23 runs. So today, this morning, we had a 14-11 game, and this is a 13-10 game. Sunday baseball in college, ba tell you in college what, baseball. I'm worried about the state of pitching with what we've seen this weekend. Just the inability to accumulate outs or throw strikes. And usually they go hand in hand. And quite frankly, now you're putting guys into situations they never envisioned at this point in the game. That's the downside of matchup baseball when you're trying to go one for one or play at bat to at bat get the lefty lefty get the righty righty is at some point it, the well is going to run dry and if the game doesn't end when you think it's going to end or if the game doesn't end the way you think it's going to end all of a sudden you're left with guys that aren't necessarily right. used to being in a high leverage type situation just going out there and being kind of just thrown into it into the fire Keep in mind, you're going to walk here, and the tying run comes to the plate. And that's strike three. LaFleur rung up. Williams had made the pitch to get the first out of the inning. It's a dotted up fastball right there by Williamson just puts it right on the edge. I don't know if Trey LaFleur was frozen by the fastball or was looking for a breaking ball, but either way, that's a well executed pitch for strike three. Good pitch. This is Torres. Take a first pitch slider for strike one. Matt Daggs told us that his catcher situation this year was going to be a fluid situation where he's going to kind of ride the hot hand. And Jose Torres comes in last night, gets the pinch hit homer. So he's in the lineup today, and he's produced. Down in the count here, nothing and two. That foul ball just about took out three birds that were sitting on an empty chair in the club level. Birds are wondering why there's still people here. This is normally the uh, time the sprinklers are on, and it's good eating. The sprinklers came on an hour ago. <laughs> but uh, they'd still be going if we didn't have to stop them again. <laughs> so we've had seven runs alone in this 11th inning. Combined, five for the Kooks. A lot of Houston fans wanted to punch out there. Instead, the count goes to two balls, two strikes. <laughs> Williamson got the strike out of LaFleur, and he's going to get the strike out of Torres. There were two times about an hour ago when the Cajuns were down to their final strike of the game. Now they're down to their final out again. There's no quit 
in this Louisiana offense, so they're not going to go down easy. But Tim Williamson, he's made a couple of really nice two-strike yeah. pitch pitches. Froze LaFleur on the fastball and was able to freeze Torres on the backdoor slider right there. And this is Stelly. He didn't enter this game until the seventh inning, and he's had a full game. At least it's felt that way. A chopper up the middle. Is that in no man's land? And it was kicked and it rolls away. So the tying run will come to the plate after that boot. It'll be scored a base hit for Stelly. It's a tough play right there for De Jesus, kind of a high chopper that gets over the mound but doesn't make it all the way through to the base. His best his best chance right there is probably to scoop it up and make the tag at second. He tries to come through and play it for the throw at first and just kind of rolled up his arm. I knew you're curious if Broussard's hit a home run this year. He has not. Today, he has batted six times. This is seventh plate appearance. He's driven in a run. But a Crawford box special here, and we have a brand new game. Got to be careful with that slider. If you're throwing it in, you got to make sure you get it all the way down and in. This is the, this is the situation where, as a left-handed pitcher, I probably want to stay on the outer third of the plate. Make Broussard beat you out to the big part. Nothing, nothing pull side. 1-1 one, one pitch on the outside corner. Cajuns down to their final strike again. We've seen this dance before. Bottom of the 11th inning on a Monday morning and we'll play on two and two. You can see Williamson is looking for that backdoor slider that he got Torres with try to start it in the left handed batter's box and bring it back. Not quite enough there but Thinking along the same lines of I don't want to miss on the inner third of the plate. Give Broussard something to turn on. A 2-2. Cut on and missed. Ball game over at 12.32 on a Monday morning. And the 11-inning special. The Cougars celebrate their first win of the weekend. And my goodness, did they have to work overtime to get it. It wasn't an easy road. It was back and forth. It was long. There were lots of changes. But even though it's 12.30, at night, you look at the emotion of this Houston Cougars team. They knew coming into it that they really needed to get a win. And that's the beauty of college baseball right there is that every game means so much to these kids. Four and a half hours, the 11 innings, 25 combined left on base. Brian, <laughs> thanks for joining me today. I enjoyed working with you. It was a full day for everybody. It was indeed special. Thank you to our crew that uh, did yeoman's work over the course of three long days of baseball, albeit good contest here for the Astros Foundation College Classic. For Brian Bogusevic and our entire crew, I'm Brett Dolan, thanking you for tuning in. Our final score in 11, the Cougars take down the Cajuns 13 to 10. Sleep fast, good night, good morning. Thanks for joining us from Minute Maid Park.